everybody, it's Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso. Welcome, welcome. How is it doing today for everyone? I am very, very excited for lots of reasons, but the big one obviously is it is Recall Launch Livestream Day. So it launched yesterday. There's a lot of information out there, but today is the day I actually get to talk about it. First of all, before we go too far, is the audio good? Is the camera good? Doesn't seem to be working. How does it sound on Twitch? How does it sound on YouTube? Who do we got hanging out? Uh, we got to do an experiment here. Who's um, I turned on this Nightbot thing as an experiment, and it's um, it's saying some people are spamming. So I might have to turn it off if it's not good, because I thought it could be fun to do a couple different things. But audio sounds good. Video seems good. Excellent. Excellent. Who do we got hanging out? We've already got a bunch of people on both YouTube and Twitch. I'll do a couple quick shout outs. We got Chop, Carson, LC, Michelangelo, Sam, uh, Carson, Thanos. Lots of people over there. Crossfader, Level Bevel, Dean, Jezebella, <laughs> Bing Bong, D uh, Ivana, Eric, Scott. Oliver, we oh man, there's so many people hanging out over on Twitch. How's it going, everyone? I'm so I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so excited to finally talk about recall. Uh, I will be paying attention to the chat quite a bit. This is going to be interacting with people. I want to look out for questions, anything you want to see. We'll be tinkering around. Everything will be focused around recall, but there'll be several times where I'll be looking for ideas and we can make things up as we go. But I do have a lot of really nice um, demo files already built together, and I'm looking forward to showing off um, some of the more use cases. The, the little animation, the spot I put together kind of just showed the basic workflow, but it actually does quite a bit all over the place. And it's been driving me crazy not being able to show this during some of the Rocket Lasso live streams and some of the tutorials because there's so many times where it's like, oh, this would have been really helpful right now because we're about to bake something now and make it editable. Should be, um, it, it should unlock a lot of opportunities. <sighs> we got Art dude, oh man, there's so many names, I can't even list them all. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and hanging out, scrolling down, making sure I don't miss anything. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, let's see, what are some details I need to cover? This is going to be loose. I'm, I, I prepped files, but, you know, I like doing the stuff off the cuff a bit, keeping it a little bit more live. First of all, um, if you don't already have recall, the idea here is to see some of the features and how it can work for you. And there's links below on YouTube and there's a link below on Twitch. If you're on Twitch, I set up this cool Nightbot thing. So you see there's a little, uh, you can type in exclamation mark purchased and it should pop up a little message. So if you've bought, if you have purchased recall already, type in exclamation mark and then the word purchased. And then I want to see if it pops up and works um, just for fun. In fact, I'm going to type one in. Oh, is it not going? Like Crossrader, you typed it correctly and it's not triggering. Oh, now it's okay. It, it lags behind. There it is. <laughs> so yeah, there's Nightbot calling it out. Um, so thank you so much. So if somebody happens to go and purchase it during during the chat, feel free to put it in there so it pops up. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's the same bot. So if I have to turn it off, I will, but it's fun. It's a weird little thing. So anyway, a couple things to cover for recall um, as we continue to say hello to everyone. But oh, I, also I did, a, I did a change. Let me see if the cursor is showing up on the screen. I'm going to temporarily show my screen. And do we see my mouse cursor? Yeah, I, I changed some settings so that I could trick the software into showing a bigger mouse, which I think is just helpful. Um, so yeah, man, I, I'm frazzled because there's so many different things to talk about. Um, so thank you everybody for hanging out. Uh, sadly, it's not set up on YouTube. It only works on Twitch, but there are two different chats going on. Thank you so much, everyone for hanging out. Now, some details. First of all, um, it was really interesting as I was putting together stats. First of all, Recall, the plugin, is over 9,000 lines of code to make it work. So this is not some simple like copy and paste. Like It's doing a lot of things, a lot of organization, a lot of organizing for people. There's a bunch of different settings we haven't even really gotten to talk about like in any of the videos I've released so far. So that's going to be fun to talk about. And then it turns out between me and my two brothers, and my two brothers work full time. We started the company together, Rocket Lasso. The two of them are full-time code. All the, Their only job is coding and working on code. And between the three of us, while we were developing tools back in the day at GSG, combined, we have over 20 years of experience developing tools for Cinema 4D. So there you go. You got 20 years of experience helping put these things together. 
Now, specifically, Recall was put together by me and one of my brothers, Danny. We've spent a lot of time going back and forth. We had a bunch of people on the beta, which wrapped up not too long ago. If you're in the chat and you're on the beta, please do a quick shout out. Thank you so much for supporting and helping out and answering questions and giving suggestions as well. Uh, next up, um, let's see. The, the Some of the important details here are that, well, let me go and do some of the demo stuff. Uh, yeah, Crossfader was definitely on the beta helping test things out well you know I, I got a bunch of different things to mention as we go but let's start uh let's start talking about recall and then we can man uh, <laughs> um oliver keeps getting hit by uh the night bot what what are you are you typing in lots of symbols to do it why what's the uh what's the deal my brother suggested it he, he uses a lot of twitch and uh i thought it'd be cool but anyway i've got a lot to talk about inside of recall so let's start doing that for sure in to sharing my screen here inside of cinema 40 r22 or s22 as they call it let me rearrange my windows a little bit so i can keep reading the chat properly if anybody has any questions as we go let me know because that's the super important part. Now, Recall is a tag plugin. You can find it, and I'll just pop open a cube here. You can find it by right-clicking, and down at the bottom of your tags, you'll see Recall. Now, let's um, let's do actually something super duper basic. Let's model something simple. Um, actually, uh, from the chat, what's a simple thing to model? I'm talking really simple, because I don't want to spend all day doing modeling, because a lot of things can be really complicated. So we're talking crazy simple. But whatever is, sounds like a good suggestion, I will jump on and start tinkering with. Let's see. Roger, Chris, Simon, Jake. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, Ryzen, Level Bevel, Zach, Brolius. Uh, an avocado, a house, apple, banana, pencil, cloud, a chair. Uh, I kind of like the idea of a chair, actually. It's a, that's uh, yeah, a chair, a table. Let's do a chair. I, I, I already did demos talking about a table, but I like the idea of a chair. We'll keep it very simple. So. Recall does a lot, but here's the most basic, basic of things. Creating a cube, we're going to be making changes to this to make our chair. Let's say there's a couple of subdivisions on here. I'll hit NB in cinema to make sure that that is subdivided properly or what I think is going to be accurate. Drag this down to be something small. I'm not going to worry about the overall scale. When I model something, I just, I just model it. And to the very end, I scale it down to the proper scale. So here is the basics. Now I'm going to make this editable. Now it wouldn't be difficult to get back here, but let's just, let's start by right clicking on a cube and saying, I want a recall tag. You can see the basic interface here. There's not too many settings. And I want to store this object as it currently is. So by clicking the store button, you'll see the recall icon appear and is now stored the state of this object as it is. Every parameter, all of its children, every tag, everything about it has been saved. So that means we can continue working on it say make it editable and then actually now, now you see i've made it editable let's mess this up intentionally so i'll just grab a polygon drag it up okay super messed up now if i were to click on the recall tag go back to the recall button and click it you see that not only does it get rid of that messy polygon but it's gone back to being this parametric cube so that is the very very basics let's start modeling this chair making this editable I will do a loop selection around the outside and deselect those. Hit D for extrude, drag that out a bit, do another loop selection, deselect, 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 D for extrude, hit apply. And I do that because it's very simple now to select these four square corners. Now hitting D for extrude, drag that down, get the four legs of the chair. And actually, yeah, that's pretty good basic start. Let's keep it. Well, actually, even here, it could potentially be a stool. So let's stop right there and create another recall tag. Now I'm going to do this very mechanically. As we keep going, I will speed up and speed up and start using all of the uh, using the features quicker. But let's just methodically go through it for everyone who has not seen it yet. So right clicking on the cube, I can click on another recall tag and click store again. You'll actually see that the recall tag this time will change to the color green because it's detected that there was already a tag of the same color, so it gave it a new random color. Now that I have two tags, I could click on the first one and say recall, and we go back to the cube. Click on the second one and say recall, and I can go back to the final state where we had saved this. Let's continue modeling a bit. So I think we need a back to this chair. So how about, what's the scale of this? That's 20.4. 
I'll copy the scale of X, select another polygon, D4 extrude, pull this up however much I want. Actually, we'll keep the back relatively low, pulling this down. D4 extrude again, but this time I will do a very short one and another one. Pull this up some more. D for extrude, and we'll do another one like that. Now, very simply, I could select that polygon and that one. Hit B for bridge. Bridge between those two. Select that and that. B for bridge. Connect between those two as well. And now we've got a as basic as you possibly can chair. Let's start increasing our speeding up our workflow a little bit. First of all, why not name this chair? right click on it and say, I want another recall tag. Now, instead of going down to the store button, I have an empty recall tag here. So what I could do is just double click on it and that triggers a new store state that is now stored. And once something is stored, all you have to do is double click on any of the tags and it will jump back to that state. So I can say, you know what? I want to go back to the original queue because I want to you know, continue from this point. I can double click on the middle one, jump to when it was a stool, jump to the third one and jump to when I had a back on it. All right, those are some super basic. Let's continue modifying this a little bit. In this case, how about we stretch out the top of the back of this chair? Pull that up, now it looks all right. Increase my selection, pull that down a bit perhaps. And yeah, we could even scale up this middle unit a little bit, give that a little bit better lumbar support. All right, so that's a very basic change, but I'm gonna kind of go overboard and keep on creating more recall tags. Now let's speed up our workflow even more. And that is if I were to hold down control or command on the Mac and drag this over to the side, I've made a copy of it. So one thing you do is click the override button. So I will do that, click override. You see a new color is generated. Now I've got four different tags and you'll see that the there's whichever one we are most recently stored or recalled there's a little triangle up in the upper corner showing what the what state we're currently looking at so once again i can click between these different states and see the different ones we're in the newest one and let's just make a change let's say i want to start adding in let's start making some curvature into this it doesn't it looks a little stiff right now so maybe grab these middle ones pull that down a bit grab a loop selection here pull that down a bit just get a bit Get a little bit of a curve into that. How about selecting this section and pulling that back? And oops, too far there. And selecting the top one again, R for rotate. Perhaps yeah, rotate that backward a little bit. Get a little little bit of a curvature to that. And if we're going further, how about a edge selection? So I'll do a U B. Select the edge. 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 M F for edge cut say yes i want to cut it and let's do two cuts now doing a loop selection l u l sorry u l there we go u l select 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 and i can put a little bit of curvature into those legs let's see what's the best way to do that yeah that's kind of nice we'll do that all right so we've added a little extra detail onto those it, you know and we can keep on adding extra modeling detail anywhere that we like so this is just the very simple modeling demo these could these feet could hit I for inner extrude, D for extrude, I for inner extrude, go bigger, go down. And actually, let's do another inner extrude. And then that one I can pull down. And there we go. Get some fancy little feet on the chair. Let's store that state as well by duplicating the last tag again, holding that control. I can make another one. Now, instead of clicking the override button, if I hold down control or command on the Mac and double click, it will trigger an override. So it overrode that. What this means is we can completely use a double click workflow without having to go down into this interface and make changes to the tags. So it is as quick as creating a new tag and double clicking and you stored it, double click and you will go back to it. You will recall it, double click with control and you can override it. So that is one of the key, key workflows of recall. So once again, let's look at the different states that we have. Now we've been using this in a very simplistic way with a single object. Let's go and perhaps make this a little bit trickier on ourselves. Let's do another loop selection here. D for extrude. We'll just make that a little bit bigger along the center of the chair. And we could, let's see, let's do a loop selection here and there, there. UF, fill in the front, pull this down. I'm not 
sure I should have looked at a chair reference. I guess I go maybe up a little bit more in front. So just a couple little extra tweaks on that. Now, what is one of the most destructive things you can possibly do? Yeah, the curve, I added a few too many curves to this chair, I think. I should have uh, had a specific reference. Maybe those can uh, just get a little bit of curve there. That's a little better. Um, one of the most destructive things you can do to any object you're modeling is bevel it. And beveling, well, I mean, bevel is just destructive. Anytime you bevel something, it makes it almost impossible to go and make the types of changes that we've been making to this chair. So why don't we actually, I just, uh, I keep seeing little things I want to tweak on the model. Not that it's an amazing model in any way, but just pull that down a bit. And maybe even pull down the front just a hair. Yeah. I've got a lot to cover, so I shouldn't spend this much time on anything, but I just want a little bit more of a dip there. There we go. All right. So let's bevel this thing. Uh, now, we're lucky in Cinema 4D that we have a parametric bevel. We have a bevel deformer. So this actually stops us from doing a very destructive bevel in general. That could be fed in. We can do as much of an offset as we want, add in a couple extra subdivisions, so we really round that out, change the way we're looking at it here to subdivide it more. That actually looks pretty good. The parametric bevel is it does a really great job of rounding these things out in general. I could do something like create a solid bevel, and this makes things very nice to uh, be able to put this entire thing into something like a subdivision surface. So let's put that into a subdivision surface, and you can see everything will get very rounded. Uh, I guess the back doesn't connect quite so well, but everything will get nice and rounded along the corners. I kind of like the subdivision surface on that. We could subdivide that stuff more later. In this case, I don't want it to look a little bit too chunky as it was there. So back to it being a nice rounded chamfer. So that is parametrically beveling it. Now, we didn't change too much from the last one, so I'll just override this previous tag. But what you'll see now is if I were to jump back to any step, the that bevel goes away. But if I go back to the last one, that comes back in the hierarchy as well. Now, let's make um, let's start rounding out a couple of these pieces manually. So hit UL, select that, that MS for bevel. And I can actually bevel those edges and round that out a bit. UL, select that loop and that loop that loop, MS, bevel those two as well. Just adding a little bit of curvature, make that look a little bit better. And then uh, we probably should have subdivided the chair back and we're still parametric here. So something like UB, select, select, MF for, cut, for edge cut to a subdivision in the middle, UL, loop, loop, and scoot those back a little. There we go, that looks a little comfier. So just making little tweaks to the chair. Now, this bevel has it's a time where like we're, we want to bake it down. We want to bake down this chair. So let's store it in this current state and then let's bake this thing down. The way I like baking things down, we could right click. Actually, let's try that. Let's right click and say current state to object and it will actually just bake it down just fine. So I'll delete that. Now I've got a baked down bevel. Now I think it's a good time to store that. Let's make another copy. Hold down control as I make a duplicate. And we now have this bevel version. And here's where things get dangerous is if the client comes back and they want to change and they definitely would want changes on this chair. If they want a change, it's like, oh, I want this front to pull in a little bit. Then as you make your selections here, I could select these very carefully. And if I were to try and pull this backward, we're starting to break the bevels that are around it. They're actually getting skinnier. So the bevels are getting dramatically affected by these changes that we're making. So that would be that would be something that's not good. And just when you're modeling like a spaceship or a car or anything for a client, it's like, oh, no, I beveled something and now I need to go back. Well, we can. We've stored that current state, but how about we double click and we can jump back to when this was a parametric bevel. Now, if you're anything like me, and actually this is showing you a better or another use case for recall, then if you're anything like me, there's a good chance that you would have just been storing this as you modeled, as you go, which would be probably something like this. Let me do, delete these. It'd probably be something like, okay, I have a chair. I need a backup of it. Like, oh, let's hide it. Let's make another, you know, another copy of the chair. Do it. Hide it. And if you're being really organized, maybe you have all these things in a null, hitting Alt G. It's like you can, this is like your your folder where those are like the backups of your, mo of your models. You say backups. And you just keep on dropping things inside of that folder. But now we can get rid of all that and we can just see it all directly in these tags, we can jump back to any state. Anytime we're gonna do something destructive or that we wanna A, B test or go back to, we can just do it with a double click now. 
Now let's get a little bit fancier. And actually I've got other chair demos. So I'll talk about those steps when we get there. Let me take a look at the chat because I've been mostly just focused on cinema. Um, yeah, a lot of people, I, I'm not too familiar with a lot of other 3D softwares and I've a lot of people have been commenting where there are other things, there are other softwares that have things that are similar um, so it's kind of cool that there are other ones and everybody's like, oh, it's just like this. I need it. And it, like, I like that. Um, once again, anybody who might go pick up recall as we're talking, go and look in the chat. You should be able to put exclamation mark purchased. And I want to see it every time that pops up, that'd be really cool. So let's see. Oh yeah. People are getting the, uh, I didn't know Nightball gave you all the info, but yeah, you just type in exclamation mark recall and you can get the link to recall. They also made one for Slack. So going to a demo scene that I have and feel free to ask questions. Um, next up is, yeah, I guess we'll jump back to the lamps because I want to show you another simple use case, but man, is it really fun? So here is the MoGraph tree. It's something I made in a bonus live stream and it's a fully rigged tree and it's also dynamic. So there's all these dynamic spheres and they're trying to stay attached to the branches and they get bounced around. It's just a really fun scene file. I didn't know what to do with it. And it makes ends up working out to be a very good uh, tool for showing off recall. So we've got this tree. It's waving in the wind, moving around. A couple people have requested a tutorial. So maybe in the future I can make something like that. Um, so Crispy, what is recall? Actually, it's a good time to recap. Um, so we're going to be using recall in this case to you to control on our camera. Recall as a tool is a new plugin from Rocket Lasso. We just launched it. So me and my two brothers, our small team, just built this tool. And what it does is store the current state of your object or the entire hierarchy or its keyframes, everything about it, so you can bring it back at any moment. And the workflow is very quick. So in this case, I've got a camera. Let's, let's hit play a little bit and frame this up however we want to. So let's get our initial shot. And let's just say this was supposed to be framed up here. And let's say that's this is going to be like the rendering shot. That's where you want to go back and render finally. So on this camera, how about I right click, grab recall the tag, and then double click. And that stores everything about the camera, everything about it, including its position, its focal length, everything. So I've got that position. So tell me if you tell me if this sounds familiar where you're like, okay, cool. I've got my camera locked. It's, it's not going anywhere. I'm going to remember not to do it. And you're like, Oh wait, uh, I gotta go make a change here. It's like, Oh, there's something about this grass isn't quite right. Let me grab those. And maybe they should be a little bit smaller. So I'll shrink those down. Let me see. Let me zoom up a little bit and like, okay, cool. And you're like, Oh no, I moved my camera. I didn't want to do that. So you hit view undo view. If you didn't know there's an undo view. There's also a shortcut, Control Shift Z, and I can hit undo, undo, undo. And then you suddenly realize how much you move your camera and you do it all the time. And as I zoom out, it's like, oh, was that my camera angle? But let me hit undo one more time. It's like, oh, maybe that was my camera angle. One more time. Oh, maybe that was my camera angle. And you're like, ah, but the other render didn't do it. It like drives me absolutely nuts. Well, now I can be rotating around, go anywhere we want, go get lost in the weeds here. And I'd be like, oh, uh, I need to go back to my camera position. There's my recall tag, double click. We're back to that position. We're completely free to move our camera around, make any changes we want. At any given point, double click on the camera, go back to that spot. Now I know that is a very basic use case. Let's go ahead and make it a little bit fancier. Maybe we have a couple different shots that we want. So maybe we want a nice low angle one looking up at the tree. So now I could create another right click, recall tag, double click. And once again, it is detected that it has the same color as the previous tag. So it will make it a new color. And now I have a second spot. I could go and zoom into any position I want. I could even super distort my camera here. If I double click on that tag, we'll go back exactly to the camera as it was. Double click on the first one, go back to this original position. So, okay, that's cool. Really nice to be able to jump between those. But now let's get a little bit fancier still. What if we want a camera animation on this thing? Well, at the beginning, let's say that we're starting out down here from the a bug point of view, hang out near this branch. So there is our position. Grab the camera, coordinates, and let's record the position and the rotation. I'll click manually kick the keyframe, click the keyframes and hit play. We'll let it run for a little bit right around there. This is gonna be a terrible camera move by the way, but let's zoom out along the ground a little bit. And as we zoom out along the ground, how about we pan up? We start panning up a bit. So record right there. Let's see what we got. So it's going to start zooming out and up and then let it play out a little bit longer. And right around now, this could have moved even further and maybe we even zoomed off to the side a bit. Keyframe that as well. 
And we could keep on going. Let's just say that we keep the camera alive by going a few frames further. We'll drift a little bit, go a few, well, we'll go a big chunk later and we'll drift a bit, just to keep the camera alive. So if I were to, and let's shorten the animation down to whatever, 300. So now we've got this camera movement. So if I hit play, now we've got an animated camera. Okay, well, that's that's fine. That's good. Well, okay, let's store that. We don't want to lose this. We have an animated camera. So let's create a copy of a recall tag. So holding on control or command on the Mac, I can override it by clicking the override button or holding down control as I double click it and it will override it. Once again, a new color appears. You get the little highlight on the corner saying that's the current one. So that has now stored that state. If I hit play, We've still got our animation. Nothing changed. Let's go back to our original camera, though. If I were to try and like manip you know, move here, we're, we're it's going to keep on jumping back to that spot. So instead of playing this animation, I'm going to double click on the very first tag, and we go back to our original camera position. If I hit play, you'll see the camera is not animated. If I click on the camera, you see there are not. Oops, I just accidentally clicked. But you'll see there are not any keyframes on here. They're gone. They are, but they are stored inside of the recall tag. So I could jump from our first camera position to our second camera position and then jump to our third one. And as soon as I click on the third one, now the keyframes are back. If I click on the camera, the keyframes have returned and we're in this new position able to animate. Let's push it even a little bit further and let's get an entire rig going. In this case, how about we get a fly around on this tree? So I'll create a circle spline. I want to go back to the first camera view so I'm free to move around. Here's a circle spline. Lay it flat on the ground via X and Z, T for scale. Make it nice and big. Move in the air, so into the air, so we're not on the ground level. Right clicking on the camera, I want an animation tag aligned to spline. So this camera should be aligned to a spline. So drag in the circle. So that is now linked. I want to keyframe this at this time, and uh, it doesn't go too fast. So I'll go all the way to the end and keyframe all the way to uh, all the way to 100. So click to keyframe that as well. If I were to re rewind, hit play, the camera's going to move, but of course it's just going to be looking forward the entire time. So we need this to target something. So creating a target for ourselves. How about a nice just end side? Um, let's see, I will. Well, I don't want to move up too far. And let's not use an end side. Let's just use a null. doesn't matter. So I got null and that is what the camera is going to target. So right click on the camera, animation, add a target tag, target the null. If you want to stay organized, you should definitely rename it, but we got a lot to talk about. So I'll move this up into the air. That's where I want it to actually be looking. So all that information is now on this camera. It's got this tag. It's got this aligned to spline. If I hit play, we should add some keyframes where this thing is slowly spinning around the entire tree. So we've got, got a fourth completely unrelated camera movement now. Uh, I don't want to see the circle. It's got this weird horizon line. So we're spinning around, seeing what this is doing. How about we store that state? So right in this Let's make a new tag this time. Recall, double click, got a new tag. I'll move it to the end because I want to go kind of first, second, third, fourth. So I've got a fourth camera movement there where there are keyframes on a tag. There are two tags. They are linked to external things. Hit play and we're spinning around. Double click the first one, back to the original position. Double click the second one. Double click the third one and rewind so we can actually see we've got that motion going. Double click on the third one. And now we're back to spinning around the tree. This camera was able to store the state of all that information. And in spite of the, this object essentially going being stored away and these tags not showing up as we load the other ones, these still remember not only what they were linked to external to where the recall tag was, they are keeping their individual keyframes as well. So I just absolutely love this as a workflow just for the camera. Like I'm going to use this so often, I don't know. I. Maybe it's not worth the uh, recall is currently one hundred and nine dollars and I know it's not a cheap plug in. But as I continue showing you everything it does, I hope you'll see that it's super duper worth it. Um, and I guess it is worth noting that uh, Rocket Lasso uh, here, I'll even jump up on the screen here. Rocket Lasso as a company, we don't take on client work. So our job here is to make plugins and sell them. And then I, because we do that and because we can make our living off of the plugins, that's how I can make all the tutorials for free. And that's how I can be doing a live stream and answering questions for everybody. And just everything I do extra with that for free is supported by the idea that I can make tools and sell these useful tools to people, things that people want 
And so it's kind of like the best of all worlds there. So at that point, I'm not going to, I'm going to make high quality plugins. Like I said, the team here is 20 years of experience specifically making plugins for Cinema 4D. So we know what we're doing. We're trying to make the highest possible quality tools. I'm very worried about workflow and the way the user interfaces with it. So things like this double click workflow, like we put a lot of work into making sure that this worked. So the tool I want to always be worth it, but also we need to make a living off of this stuff. So that is, well, the price tag is what I thought was fair for this. And I was like, well, should I make it cheaper? And it was like, no, I'm going to be confident in pricing this this way because I try and do a lot for everyone. I try and do a lot of free stuff. I want everybody to be doing better work all the time and to enable me to do that. I am going to charge the fair price for the tool. And we've been working on this thing. It, it, we, we started early on. And we spent just like a week or two on it. And then I started playing with it. I was like, holy cow, this tool is so powerful. We need to keep on developing it. It's at one point going to be a bonus tool with something else we were working on. And I was like, holy cow, this is incredibly powerful. This is going to be, I, I think it's kind of a game changer in my workflow. And I started getting obsessed with it. So we spent like the last four months focused on getting this working. So this is four months worth of work from, well, as much time as I could put in and my brother working on it almost full time. So there's a lot of work in this thing. Anyway, we've got a lot more demo stuff to talk about, so we will keep on going through. Uh, let me see if there's any questions. I do want to wrap up some details here. Oh, man, there's so many people chatting. Somebody got recall. Thank you so much. Once again, once again, if you buy recall while the stream is going, type in exclamation mark purchased and it will pop up. And if you want information about recall, you can see it in the information below the video or you can um, type in exclamation mark recall and it will pop up as well. Um, Okay, so as we talk about extra details, let me pop up in the corner. Oh, I just have one more detail, especially relevant for a lot of people here, and I hope you didn't miss out on it. Um, if you are supporting on Patreon, even if you join right now, if you go and join my Patreon, and there's a link below in the video, you can join the Patreon, and I have coupons for this plugin. So if you are a $10 member, there's an $11 coupon. If you are... If you are a $20 member, there is a $21 coupon. So you actually essentially get a profit of a dollar by joining Patreon, getting that coupon and then buying the tool. And, and then there's like a, there's a higher, there's higher levels and there's coupons for those as well. So if you want to do it, then that's a great way to continue supporting and you'd start seeing access to the old bonus. Well, there's all the bonus streams and the scene files from the old streams, and I'm going to be doing more streaming as well. There's gonna be another live stream about something completely unrelated, unrelated next week. Um, so yeah, that's another way of supporting. So yeah, if you're supporting a Patreon, you already have a coupon. And if you want to join, you can join now and then get the coupon. So thank you so much, everybody. And I, I do really appreciate that support. So it did too many people type it. I couldn't, uh, well, everybody do it slowly, sprinkle them in as you go. Um, so jumping back to the screen, I want to talk a little bit more about the organizing, but I know, um, I, there's questions coming in. Um, oh yeah. Uh, Fabri, I super duper appreciate that. I saw, I saw your tweet actually. And, uh, and Tom, thank you guys for, for making it in. Uh, I do appreciate it. Um, and, and I agree. It's not, I, I, I think that this is priced accurately. And then when I look at what a lot of other people are selling, it's doing a lot. But if you are a, a working professional, I think that this pays for itself so, so quickly. But anyway, a little bit more to talk about because we have done very little so far in actual recall. What I'd like to show you now is some of these nifty customized icon buttons. We're still here in the tree animation. We can get our tree. Yeah, we're still spinning. So that's a nice one. Now, Currently, you saw that these were automatically generating colors every time we made a new tag because it was detecting that, hey, there's already something of this color. Let me go and make a unique color just so that they look different and you can maybe keep track that way. And that was happening because of this auto checkbox. But we have customized icon options. And we once again, everything here is all about like this one click or you know two click solution. So in this case, I could click on any of these colors and instantly change all of the tags to look whichever color I want. I can click on the randomize color button and it will randomly assign different colors to every single one of them. I could do a color picker and let's select one tag. I could do a probably a good idea to pause it. So I'm not chasing it color picker and pick one of these kind of purpley pink colors and select a different one and select different color. You can see that those can be colorized that way. In this case, I can also click on the one, two, three button and it will number every single tag I could 
clear those out and go back to the default recall icon. I can also click on the ABC and that will automatically generate those in order. And then just to show you, we didn't change anything about the camera, but if I were to make another tag and then override it, so click override or hold down control and double click to override it, recall is smart enough that it's going to detect which letters were used and automatically add the next letter in sequence. It does the same thing with the numbers. And then we also have, let's say that this is the final. So, you know, this could be A, B, C, D, E, but I could say E exclamation mark. And I have now typed in an exclamation mark and it pops up there in the actual tag. I could type in anything I want here. Let's do an at symbol. So that is now customized it. I could type in, you can actually type in anything you want. So I could type in R and you'll see an R. I could type in R E. But and as you go, it's going to keep on automatically adopting the scale. So once you add like two or three, it starts getting too small. So I could type in recall. And at that point, it's going to be a couple pixels across it. But it is whatever you type in here. So it's up, left up to your judgment. A couple exclamation marks fit in there very nicely, though. So that is a quick little bit of customizing your icon. And if you don't want it automatically randomizing and whatnot, you can turn off the auto. All righty. Are there any questions about the camera specifically? Because I've got way more demos to talk about. And um, <laughs> recall without Nightbot. Uh, Nightbot bad. Yeah, maybe we'll kill off. Uh, maybe we'll kill off Nightbot. Nightbot bad. bad. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so once again, any. Uh, OK, uh, Carson um, asking again is. Oh, yeah. And everybody, there's a lot of chat happening. So if feel free to repeat your question. Like I'm not I'm not going to be upset at all if you repeat a question. Just don't spam it. And Nightbot will get angry if you spam it. Um, uh, is there a way to lock a tag? Um, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by lock a tag. How would you lock a tag like this tag is here? It's got this information. Um, I guess it would be like you don't want to accidentally override it. Uh, I didn't specifically build that functionality in. It just continues to live here. So unless you click override, it's not going to override it. And if you mess something up, like undos work really well. We worked. It's actually really, really hard when you're coding to make undos work properly, especially when something as complex as recall is concerned. But if I were to accidentally override a tag, let's say I was doing um, I was spinning this around and then I deleted these for some reason and I accidentally override the recall tag, you can undo it. I can hit undo and it's actually gone back to the previous state and then I can undo and get these tags back and that this recall is continuing to work. So you can always undo, but you cannot lock specifically. Uh, then, um, is there a way to make a quick visual note about what the tag is doing? Carson Jones, I am so glad that you asked that question because in addition to customizing the icon, we can also go to the notes tab. And under the notes tab, we get a whole bunch of information about what is inside this recall tag. So personally, I mean, my workflow, I, maybe it's just the way my brain works. Typically, I think just putting them in order and because it's so, oh, I should probably show the screen. Um, show the screen, yeah, sorry. Anyway, repeating myself, Carson Jones, thank you so much for asking that question uh, because it's a, quick, a great question. If you were to click on a recall tag, every single recall tag comes with a notes tab. And inside here is all the information I could possibly think to give the user as far as what this recall tag is doing. Now, the way my brain works, and maybe my brain is weird, is as long as I put these in order, it's so quick to jump between them that like, personally, I don't think I'm ever going to write notes, but other people, especially in the beta, they wanted notes. So I listened and we added notes in. So first of all, when you record or override a recall, it's going to automatically update this date information. So you put any info in there you want. And then we have this notes tab. So I could say this is MoGraph tree and hit enter spinning cam. And now there is notes on that one. So that is noted. And then we have the contains tag, and this will be a list of every single object that is stored within that tag. And then even better still, we have a render view button. If I click render view, then whatever the current viewport looks like is going to get stored inside of that. Now I have this left off by default. It's off by default because it's a render. Let me actually show you. Let's go to a different tag and well, let's double click said tag and then I want to click it. So it's not going to be, it's not going to take long, but if I hit render view, then there's like one and a half seconds where it's taking the render. If it was automatically doing that all the time, every time you store a recall tag, it might take, depending on your scene, it might take a second or two to actually capture the image. So it's off by default. If you want to, you can set the default to auto. And then every time you store a tag, it will automatically create a render for you. But personally, I like it only when I need it. And we can create the notes and record anything we want in there. 
Um, uh, RS animations, the information is stored in the scene file. Yes, the information is specifically in the side of this Cinema 4D file. So anywhere this file goes, all that information goes along with it. Um, so yeah, the notes tab, very important. Like in all of the demo videos and whatnot, like except for the tutorial explaining specifically the notes tab, like I almost never reference it because to me, it's not very sexy. But yeah, if you're going to be staying organized, then obviously this is an important one. And then let me show you, like here's the tree hierarchy. So if I were to right click on this tree and say, make a recall tag and double click on that one, then now you can see this giant list of all of the objects that are inside of this tree. And you can see all these joints that were made to actually make up the tree. So this is actually giving you information on every single object inside of it. So that is pretty cool as well. Oh, okay. Um, how much information is stored in memory? Um, it is it is directly proportional to what the object would have been outside of it because it needs to store everything. Everything is being stored. So every now, so what that means is parametric objects are very small, very, very tiny. We could store this camera again and again and again and again. And all it's really worried about is all these parameters. So th that's tiny. If you have a million polygon model and you make a, you store it and then you continue working on an unrelated one, you have a second unrelated million polygon model that needs to be stored. Now we tried to make it as fast as possible inside of cinema. So the, the restoring of even complex models is pretty dang quick, but there's no way of making that physically smaller. So it, it's all just stored within the scene. We'll talk about it more, but one cool thing is, and this tree isn't complicated, but if I were to right click at a recall tag and store it, so this, this tree is pretty complicated. There's a lot of objects and all that. If I were to take a copy of that and make a copy and a copy and a copy and a copy and a copy, identical ones, and I'll show you later, there's reasons to do this. The file has not gotten any bigger. It got bigger when I stored it once, but all these copies of the tag are just referencing that same information. So until I override one of them, it's not it's not getting any bigger. So that's just a little extra detail there. Um, let me see. Um, Jezebel, well, the difference between a take and a recall tag. Actually, that's really that's actually a really important question. Now, I am not an expert in takes. I don't use them that much in my workflow just because I don't need them. But a take can only store parameters. It can only store the changes you make. So in a camera, you might make a separate take and you could automatically make it override like the focal length. But what you could not do is what we did with the chair model. The take system will not remember polygon changes. It will not remember a change in hierarchy. Essentially, it's a, these objects these objects already exist and you've changed parameters. That's what take can do for you. But what recall can do for you is store everything about those objects and be able to jump between them. So that's it's actually a huge difference. Um, let's see. Let's see. Can you copy recall tag from one object to another? Uh, I'm very glad you asked. In fact, that's a perfect opening. Who asked that question? Uh, Leo, uh, can we copy an object from one object to another? Here is my next demo file to show you. Here are a bunch of lamps. And these lamps actually came from, so you've already got these if you have cinema, because in the free object volumes that they give you from Maxon, if you were to go into volume one, and then inside of volume one, there is lighting. Inside of there, we have lamps, and here are all of those lamps. So I, dra I dragged those in, I actually turned off, I got rid of the light itself because that was visually annoying. But here are all of those lamps, each one of them as its own little standalone object. So let's store these in recall. So let's select all of them, right click and say recall. Now I've got all these recall tags. Now, the fast way to do this is just click the store button and then all of them will store it. But you know, personally, I love the double click workflow. So I've actually found myself being like, nope, I want to double click on each one of them individually. But anyway, now you see that I have stored all of these different tags. So each one is stored on these different objects. So here is one of my favorite, favorite things to do. If we were to select all these, these four bottom ones and drag it onto the first object, let's delete these other lamps. Those lamps are now gone. All I've got is this lamp, but this lamp is now all of those lamps. So if I were to double click on the second tag, it turns into that lamp. Third, fourth, fifth, back to the first. It is all of those lamps in one now. So let's be a little bit more organized. In this case, uh, I've got the first tag. In fact, I can double click it. And now I want to store the color of the lampshade and double click the second one. I'll store the color of that lampshade. The third, the fourth, 
a nice blue. And the fifth, I'll grab a dark color from there. And now I've taken on the color of these different lamps. So double clicking on any of these, I can be like, oh, the, um, the client wants the blue lamp. In fact, the uh, the situation I would think of is you get you just get clients. And I, I, I've done work in the in before the days of GSG. I actually worked on like crepe, uh, on corporate like theater stuff and like trade show booths. And you would physically sometimes get the client in the room with you wanting changes. So this is not exactly a fancy table, but let's say that the client's there and they're getting really picky about like the lamp on their table. And it's like, no, I don't want that lamp. You're like, well, how about that one? How about this one? How about that one? And you can jump around and you can see the individual lamps. And then you can copy and paste this. So I've got a completely separate copy of the rig. No new information is stored as far as these individual lamps are concerned. These tags still have all that same information. I could double click on that and get a different lamp on this other table. Get a different lamp on this table. Every one of these lamps can be a copy of the other ones as many copies of those as we want. And you can now make these changes while the client is standing over your shoulder. So I can be like, oh, that lamp, uh, that one should be one of the dark lamps. And then this one, let's make that one one of these light lamps. And you can now, you can see how quickly you could do this. Now it gets even cooler than that. I really like it. Um, and that is if I were to go to the content browser, let's see if I can get this working properly. If I go up, here's the user folder. I think I can do it here. Here's a user folder. What I'm going to do is let's um, actually copy this lamp, open up a new file, paste it in. So there's the lamp. I'll even reset PSR because I want this zeroed out at the zero world. If you are working on your own objects or if you're trying to prep things or there's something you use all the time. And in my old job, I used to do this all the time. But now I could in my content browser. Um, Let's see, what's the best way to do this? I'm going to pop it out, actually. So here's a content browser. I think if I grab the lamp and drag it in here, then it's going to automatically, hopefully that worked. Yeah, well, it made a texture folder to copy those over. And now this lamp is living inside the content browser. So if I were to close that, open up a completely new unrelated scene file anywhere where I'm working on the project, we've got a table, the client wants the lamp, or I want the lamp, I'm just doing something. I could, at any point in my, I'm in my object browser, I'm like, oh, go into user folder, there's my lamp, drag the lamp in, and here is a lamp. Let's place it wherever I need to. And actually, it should be this lamp. It should be this lamp. It should be this lamp. And it should automatically be able to drag all of those in for you automatically based on these existing. Uh, I think you'd want to make sure your texture folder is linked directly, but the um, let's see if there's more questions because I got more to talk about. Um, stored in the cinema. Yep. <laughs> I love lamp. I love lamp as well. Um, uh, Orkum, or Orkin uh, is asking about camera movement. Sadly, you missed, you just missed the demo about the camera movement, but I will jump over here really quickly to show you that by storing these different recall tags, I could automatically store the first camera. So I'm in this position and I'm free to move my camera around anywhere I want. And I lost my spot. So if I were to double click on that first recall tag, it'll jump back and I can zoom, double click, it jumps back. Second tag, here's my new position. And then I animated the camera, stored it as the third tag. And now I've got this animated camera movement. And then a fourth camera, I automatically animated it with an align the spline tag and a target tag and stored it in the fourth one. So now I've got two different animations and two different static positions, and I can just double click a single double click and move to that position while still keeping the freedom to move around and do anything I want on the camera and always jumping back. So there you go. That's the 20 second version of that demo. Um, moving. Well, let me see if there's any other questions. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully that catches you up. Um, Dean, you guys are asking amazing questions. I swear I didn't plant people um, because literally, literally the next question addresses this or my next demo because uh, Dean is asking, will this work with Redshift or with third party things like X particles? Well, let me show you. First of all, I've been working on some robots. I, I, I've been having to focus on some other things. So I haven't been able to spend as much time on them as I wanted to. But here's a robot character I designed and been working on. I've been working on a whole animation of him. But I wanted him to live in a desert, in, a desert environment. And if you're going to live in a desert environment, then you want some tumbleweeds. And you're going to not only want some tumbleweeds, you're going to want a lot of tumbleweeds. 
And there's no better way of making your own your own completely custom plants than with X particles. It's just a really great tool to kind of build anything you want from scratch. So let me drag in this scene file. So here is X particles, and I've got a rig here. If I were to hit play, then you see a single particle. It's really tiny, but you see the tiny little particle drifting up from the bottom. So scrolling down, let's turn on XP branch. I'm not going to build the entire system here because it takes a while, but I'm using XP branch and it's branching, branching, branching. So turning that on, we can now see that my single particle will actually explode out and do all of that motion. And of course, you know, your next step is making an XP trail. And I have one broken out for each branch. So I can turn those on. And now you can actually see individual branches getting traced out. And this is all just X particles as a rig. And now I'll turn on the actual geometry for that. So now those are actually getting swept. And now I will hide. Let's pause that. I will hide the, not the branch. I'll hide the emitter. Yeah, I don't want to actually see the green particles anymore because now we got splines. And now you can see the actual br uh, little bit of a uh, tumbleweed that's growing based on rules I built on based on different turbulences and curves and different settings inside of these branches. So you can see here, it's doing a really nice job. This is intentionally built to be very low poly. I, I wanted it to be low poly because I was, I was going to be making so many. I'm never going to get that close to them. So here's the idea here. What if we want to make a bunch of different tumbleweeds and we just don't know which ones we're going to want. We don't know which ones we want to keep, or I just want a whole collection of them. As I sprinkle them around, uh, around, I want to be able to double click and jump to the different ones. So in this case, how about I right click on this null for the tumbleweed and say, recall, double click on it. Oops, I missed double click. And it is now stored this entire hierarchy, everything about it inside of notes. You can see that is stored all of the different objects. So we can see that. And there's the date saved and under notes, I could say um, XP setup. And then if I'm so inclined, I could even click and say render view. And whatever I see my viewport, it's going to make a little thumbnail for me. I'm going to get real nuts. Actually, what I'd probably do is something like that just to make it super crazy. So render view, store that and say, OK, that's what that's doing. Now, uh, let's say I like the look of this, but of course, we can't bring the entire XP setup into a scene file. Where we're going to be cloning so many of them. So or, you know, because we want to run quick as we grow it. So how about I turn on this connect object, which is containing all the geometry. So I'll turn that on, make this editable. And now it's baked everything down into a single object. I literally don't need any of these selection tags. It's just one material. And I'll even rename this tumble one. So that's tumble one. Right clicking on it, create a recall tag, double click to store it. I'm going to drag that up to the tumbleweed to the very top of the hierarchy. Cool, that is a tumbleweed I like. I've now stored it, it is stored. Double clicking on the first recall tag, my hierarchy comes back again. If I had to double click on this second one though, my tumbleweed, pure geometry comes in, super clean and super fast. So how about we go back to the first one and rewind all the way. And let's go inside of our emitter and say, you know what? I want to go to under advanced. I'll change the random seed, hit play. So now I'm getting a completely new tumbleweed. You can see that these branches are going way left and way more right than the other one was. Uh, you see, it takes a little while for it to generate. It's just X, X particles doing a lot of work. And now it's visually done. So how about I turn on my connect, make editable, right? Well, I'll rename it again, tumble two. delete these tags. Otherwise they'd be stored. Right click on the tumble two, recall tag, double click. There's another tumbleweed. Bring back the original X particles. We're back to this one. How about I select again, change the seed. And how about even uh, I'll click on the branch um, and how many, I didn't practice this, but how many branches do we want? I'm going to chill this out way more. We got bend in. How many branches get generated? Branch in, variation, minimum length. Uh, I guess I could shorten the length of them so they don't happen as often. That would probably work. So I, I changed a couple settings in here. So now we're going to generate a completely different tumbleweed. Once again, this yeah, I've changed some settings. It doesn't seem to go quite as many branches up near the top. But you see, I've got this one that's shot way off to the side. Do, 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 do. Okay, so that was X particles doing a lot of work. There's another tumbleweed. Same process. Make it editable. Clean it up just a bit. Tumble three. Right click, recall, store it, drag it over here. 
And now, if I were to double click on any of these recall tags, I can instantly jump between those final states. I've now got three different three different tumbleweeds and the original X particles rig that I can rewind, hit play, and regrow the entire system and make generate new tumbleweeds from there. So in this case, I could do things like, and actually this is where things get fun, is I got this one tumbleweed. I can double click and turn into this tumbleweed. I want a bunch of them. So let's say I want a copy of it. So I could just copy and paste the entire tumbleweed, move this one over here, double click a different tag, and it'll change that type. You don't actually want to change the color of these as well. So let's make it a nice tumble yellow. And if we are so inclined, I could also say one, two, three. Or this one, I should probably even call this one XP. And I'll just leave that. Well, this was one, then two, and three. So I could say one and two and three for those people who like to be nice and organized. So that's the XP one and there's one, two, and three. Copy and paste, I've got a second tumbleweed. Double clicking on, let's say number two, there is a different tumbleweed. Now that's copying and pasting, but we can chain, we can, this is something we haven't talked about yet. Recall can transform any object into anything you've stored. So how about I create a null? Here's a null, an empty null, not doing anything. And then I copy over tag number three, holding on control so I make a copy if I want. I can now double click on that tag and that null has now become that tumbleweed. I could delete the tag. It's like, okay, that null is now that tumbleweed. Maybe I had a scene file with a bunch of th placeholders in, in different spots. We could have a bunch of spheres that had been holding, you know, th these were the placeholder for where the tumbleweeds were going to be. And then when it's all done, let's actually do that. Copy, paste, I'll make a second sphere. Let's rotate that one and make a third one, copy and paste, move it over. You can hold down control actually and make another copy and spin that. Now that I've done that, I could copy over tag one, one, two, and three, select all of those and say, I want to recall. And those spheres have now turned into those objects just by making a copy of that tag. And as I said earlier, these copies of the tag do not store any extra information. They're just linked to that original information. As long as one tag, that was linked to the information that exists, then they all are sharing that information. And now I was able to, I can generate as many tumbleweeds as I want, keep the original rig without having the impact of it playing. Obviously if I hit play, well, let's do it actually. I'm gonna reload one of these as the full tumbleweed rig right here at zero. If I hit play, you can see that it's gonna chug and my frames per second are dropping down to four, five, three, as, as X particles are struggling with a ton of geometry being generated. But if I say, no, 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 you're a tumbleweed, not the X particles. If I rewind to hit play, all I did was load that and look full speed the entire time where I'm running at like 190 frames per second because it's just not activated. It's not triggering. As I said, it still exists in the scene, but it's being told in all ways possible to not calculate. So that's automatically storing everything. Um, Leo, thank you very much. Uh, Bralius, does it work with the instances? Uh, yes, it does. It will work with instances. Uh, should I show that demo yet? Um, it's not specifically super prepped, but I'm actually kind of excited for the idea of this. Um, so I will show you. So a question of does this work with instances? And here's where things can get a little bit crazy. Um, I don't need the figure anymore. That's just for scale. Um, let's, say, let's say that we have a... What's a good way of doing this? Um, I'm gonna make a sphere. So once again, let's say that we had a, like a, I'm gonna put a sphere in a null and move it up into the air a little bit. So it's like, okay, like you were roughing out a scene. You didn't know where what the tumbleweed models were going to be. Somebody else is modeling those. So you're just gonna put these spheres everywhere that those are needed. So uh, how about we put these into, well, I could make a, a let's just say that's a tumble, uh, tumble ref. So I'd say reference for the tumbleweed and you made an instance of it. So I can drag this uh, copy of the instance there, copy, paste, another one, hold down control or command as I drag, and I can just copy, copy, copy. You don't even have to copy and paste. I always forget about that. They added that in a few years ago. And if you were inclined, you know, I could take, take each one of these and spin them, rotate them, move them however I want. So these are all referencing this tumble reference. If I click on them, you see tumble ref is there. That's what they're linked to. So if I were to go to that original object and drag over one of my, I don't want to drag it over, I'm going to copy it over. So I copy over one of them. If I were to double click on that, recall pretty much only affects things that it's 
that are children of it. It's it's a on an object and the children of the object is what it's affecting. But there's a very, very important setting. And this took a lot of work and a lot of code. And that is this setting called relink to external. So what this is doing is when recall is triggered on any object at any time, recall is saying, oh, cool, you're go about, I'm about to replace this object, this tumble reference. Is anything in the scene looking at that? Is anything linked to it in some way? If I click on any of these tumbleweed instances, you can see that, yes, these are looking at that null. So if I were to double click and recall my tumbleweed, all of those instances instantly update. Now, this is not that null object anymore. There, there's no null. So in other circumstances, that would have destroyed all of these instances. They'd all be broken. They would look like that with these Xs. But what this did, what recall does, is it actually literally goes through every single object in the scene, every single parameter, every single tag, every parameter of every tag. And it says, does the object I'm about to replace exist somewhere else? Oh, it does. It exists right here. Replace it with what I'm bringing in. So all of these have referenced directly what we told that tumble to turn into. So if I were to bring in three instead and double click, then these tumble references are now referencing tumble three. So that it's, it's actually applicable in a lot of other places as well. Uh, unnamed screen. You can buy it right now if you want. Uh, bring it onto your second monitor. Uh, if you scroll down, you can go and click the purchase button. So, so yeah, that does that will automatically transfer this over to these different objects and they'll automatically relink them. I've got some demos that are coming up that will show more of that and all the other technical buttons, but thank you for that question. Um, can you keyframe? the active recall tag. I think that there is nothing, like you can see that there is literally nothing in recall that has the animation button because you're not, recall is a workflow tool. It's something that you trigger, you turn it on. So you are not supposed to animate that. It's actually in cinema as a general rule, a very dangerous idea of deleting and like, changing things when like the timeline is playing and whatnot. So this is supposed to just be like, okay, you as a user, you are swapping something over. So the idea of at a particular time, suddenly a cloner is getting destroyed and then getting replaced with a different cloner with tons of objects like that happening while it's doing something like playing would be very dangerous thing to do in cinema. So that is not, that is not something that happens. But as you see, and I think there's a question earlier about, can you could you do things like blend between tags and whatnot? That right now, that's actually a suggestion, and I'm trying to think of good ways of implementing it. And obviously, these are not. This is not a hierarchy that could be blended. But if we were to go back to our camera thing, let's say that we have camera position one and camera position two, and we wanted to somehow go between those two. Keep in mind, at any point, I could just create a null and then drag over camera position B and double click. And now that is turned into camera B. This is what camera B was. And now I could keyframe between one position and the other, or I could make a third one that could jump, you know, could be linked, or you could make a motion morph tag that's looking between these two. So you can always make a duplicate of the object. And now you've got both of them seen and you can blend between them as you want. But as far as it doing a dynamic blend through it, like there's, this can be looking at geometry and you can't just blend geometry and things like that. So that, that is not something that we ever even looked into specifically. Um, let's see. Yeah. And at any point, feel free to, and on, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Oliver, Jeff, Braulius, thank you so much. This is, I, I think I actually did a really, even though I liked the little commercial that I made, I made that little advertisement. I really like it, but I don't think it did a good job of explaining everything that recall can do. And we still got a lot more to talk about. If you've noticed, the only thing we've done so far is customizing our icons and recalling things. And there's all these other settings that we haven't even turned on yet. So I don't think I did a good job of explaining it. So that's why this live stream is important. Um, so yeah, and once again, if you if you buy recall while the stream is going, please shout it out in the chat because that makes me happy. Um, and then just to recover or recap recall, because there's a lot of people kind of coming in as we go. Um, this is a brand new tool developed by me and my brother, Danny. So it's just a two person team that worked on this one. This is the first thing that my company has launched. Effectively, this is the first time that we are making our own money from the company in the year and a half it's existed because we've been developing tools. So it's out there. Um, it's got I, it's got what I think is a very reasonable price tag for what it does, especially hopefully you agree as you start seeing everything that this can do. I think this is going to save you so much time while you're working. It's going to make your life easier while a client is standing over your shoulder. It's going to make it quicker to iterate, quicker to, to 
to change and not it's it's making so you don't have to worry about making something editable. And if you know me, if you watch my tutorials, my live streams, I do not like to make things editable. I want to keep everything as parametric as possible, because what if I need to go back? What if the client comes in and they have a change and I can't go back to that step? This enables you to do that. This enables you to make something editable. And actually, that's a really good segue into the next section. So anyway, thank you, everybody, so much for coming and hanging out. And I've got more to talk about. Uh, Carson, I do agree. That's something that is in the notes to see if there's something to do in the future. And yeah, this is actually literally the next demo. So here is, it's actually going to take a little bit to calculate. So here is the type of thing I build all the time, which is a complex parametric rig. Let me expand this all the way. If you hold down control or command as you click, it'll actually expand the entire hierarchy. So you can see that there's quite a few objects in here. It's not insane, but there's quite a bit. And it's mostly completely parametric. There's a couple like cubes and stuff that were made editable, but it's as parametric as I could possibly make it. I hit NB and you can see it's as clean as it could be as well. I'm trying to, it's got some rounded edges and whatnot, but there's a lot of bevels. There's a lot of parametric bevels. There's a lot of bools doing things. So you can see that there's actually a lot happening here. And, you know, things are getting cloned all over the place. So you can see it's a it's a relatively complex setup. Cinema has to do a lot of work to make this generate just because it's so parametric. Now, there's technically a little bit of espresso, but you'll see if I double click, it'll take a second for that to pop open. It's as simple as could be. What I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, whatever the name of this null is, feed that into a mo text. And it's also feeding into a text spline. And what that means is if I were to select this letter R, I can just, you know, double click and say, actually, you are the number seven. And it's going to update the rig and the bools and the letters and everything updates. So I get a better version of this. So it's the kind of thing that you might build for a client or you know there's going to be changes. And you can, I can type in anything that I want into here. Let's do my favorite ampersand. And you can see it's just going to update and create all this crazy geometry for me. And it's, it's just a cute little model. Now, Let's actually talk about the problem here. This is the way I like to work super duper parametrically, like an entire giant hierarchy of all these different things. Now, let's go and make a cloner. So here is your, you know, simple Cinema 40 cloner all at the default settings. It's got a count of three by one by three, which means there will be a total of nine copies. So let's go ahead and drop the letter R inside of the cloner. And when I do, I'm going to start counting one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, almost 17 seconds for that to finally pop up. And if I try and rotate my camera right now, it's going to, I'm trying, okay, there, now it finally did. So what's now happened is cinema has cached all the geometry. This is now cached. And it took that long to generate it because it's actually for one time it had to be like, OK, generate the entire object, generate the entire object, generate the entire object. And if there's nine of them, that is how long it took for this letter R to be generated. And that's that's a lot of work for cinema to do. I'm sympathetic to cinema. Now, let's actually be fair to cinema. I'm going to click on that cloner. I'm going to pull it out, click on the cloner and let's instead say multi instance. And it's going to be way quicker this time. If I drop the letter R inside the cloner, it's going to be one, two, three, about three seconds, but that's only because because it's a multi instance and only had to generate it one time instead of nine times. But anyway, let's go back to worst case scenario. So clicking on the cloner, I'll go back to the default instance mode. Okay. And now we've got this letter R and it's really complicated and there's a lot going on just because it's so parametric. So let's use recall, right clicking on my on the letter R, I can say recall, double click and store it. Now I've stored the entire hierarchy. Now, I'll click to turn on this connect all. So it's a connector and it's going to bake everything down into a single model. And I can make that editable, hit the letter C for that to be editable. Cinema still has to think to get that baked down, but there we go. It is now baked to that down. You see this is baked down as a single, what's called bool. It's got a bunch of materials. It's even got a ton of selection tags. If you watch my videos, I've mentioned that every selection tag is practically as far as it slows you down and stores information in a scene file, it's pretty much as big. This tag is as big as this entire object because it's storing a copy of all the different indexes and the information. And is it selected or is it not? So every tag here is like another copy of that object. Also, I've got this reference, which is a couple of splines and objects that are being referenced in the original thing. But just by making that editable, let's even keep going and say this is worst case scenario here. 
I'm going to leave it with all this extra stuff. We could delete a bunch of tags. I could delete these nulls. I could pull this out, clean it way up. I'm not going to do that. Let's leave it as rough as possible. Just to be clean, I'll make a copy of my recall tag. Hold down control and double click. That overrides the tag with the current information, this hierarchy. So just so you can see, I can double click on the first one and my entire hierarchy comes back and I can make changes and I can double click on the second recall tag and it's where I baked it down. And now I've just got this mess, but it's a cleaner mess. So remember how the cloner took what was almost 17 seconds to do that calculation? Well, let's go ahead and drag the letter R in now. Bink, instantly there. Now, this is this is just Cinema. Cinema enables us to do it. Cinema does not mind this very simple polygon object. It just didn't like that, com that complicated hierarchy. But for me, I don't want to bake it down because what if the client comes back and they have a change and they don't want the letter R, they want something else. So I don't like doing it. So Recall has now enabled me to not be worried, go ahead and bake it down and then store it. I've stored that state and now I'm free to drop it in. Now, just to emphasize, remember before it took 17 seconds for that to load one time. I'm gonna take this cloner, all of the default settings, and then feed in this plane effector. And this plane effector has some fields in it. It's got a random field. So if I were to hit play, you can now see that this is animating. And not only is it not taking 17 seconds to refresh, it's running at 100 and almost 130 frames per second while I'm live streaming. So you can see that this is actually working really, really well. And recall has really opened up a lot of opportunities there. Now uh, I'm the client now and I want there to be a bunch of these. So we'll make this six by six. And I don't want it to say the letter R. I want the entire word recall going across. I want to see recall, recall, recall. So let's go ahead and do that. In this case, how about I, I'm going to turn off the plane, pull out the letter R and let's bring it back to parametric. So we're back here. So I need actually a couple of copies of this this time. So how about I make a copy and a copy and I'll copy those three copies again. And now rename this uh, E, C, A, and L, L. Now it's gonna take, you know, it's cinema, it's doing it, it's a complicated rig, it's reloading all that. As I said, there's Expresso in there that should automatically be generating those or it's, it's automatically driving the, um, it's automatically driving the information. I don't need the second tag that's now empty. So now you can see that all those have updated. So I had to calculate each one of those six times, but now they have been calculated and it's a big mess because they're all overlapping each other. But you know what? That's fine. Uh, how about I turn on, let's see, is there a quick way to do this? I'm going to search for the word connect all. And there we go. Those are the six connect alls. I'm going to turn them all on. And now they've all turned on. Select all of them and hit the letter C to make them all editable. And, you know, Cinema has to cache it one time. This is just, you know, this is this has got nothing to do with the recall. This is just Cinema. And that's how complicated this model is. So it's worth calculating one time. So those have all been baked down. If I zoom out, you can see I've done the exact same thing I did with the letter R, but now for every single letter. So these are now parametric versions of that original rig. I could now duplicate that and say override, duplicate, say override duplicate, override, duplicate, override, duplicate, override. I don't even have to do this, honestly. I could always just jump back. In fact, now that I think about it, that's redundant. I don't even need to make these extra tags. These are now in their final state, and I have the ability to jump back to the earlier one if need be. So now I have six different letters. I was able to bring back from the dead, drop those into the cloner, and now instantly, you see how quickly those all popped in. I now have recall, 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 repeating. Let's feed, let's turn back on the plane effector, hit play. And now with even all these different letters, and you saw how complicated that rig was, this is still running at about 70 frames a second, once again, while live streaming. And this is just using recall to unlock the built-in power that cinema has to, it, cinema runs really quick with, with objects that are baked down. And that's what we've done, but I could always go back again. And that is, that is the important part here. Um, so uh, Brolius, thank you. Thank you so much for purchasing. Um, Oh, boy, I am. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Leo. Leo is saying that clients are not allowed to know that you have recall. It's uh, it's too powerful, and uh, and they want they'll want to pay you less money because you're working so fast. Um, okay, let me check for questions. Um, oh yeah, and I'll, I'll mention again. I'm going to repeat it. I'm I'm not going to be shy about repeating things because I know people are coming and going as uh, the day goes on, and I'm going to keep on talking for as long as people are interested. Or maybe within limits, but um, 
If you are supporting on Patreon, there's actually some coupons for you for recall. Even if you join right now, if you join at the $10 level, you'll get access to all the Patreon stuff at the $10 level, and you'll get an $11 coupon for recall. If you're at the $20, you'll get a $21 coupon. If you're at the $50 level, you have a $51 coupon. So, so yeah, you have the opportunity to, um, to support in a different way and to be able to uh, still get the tool for a cheaper price. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then there's links below for going to Patreon or just Rocket Lasso at Patreon. So let's see, question. Carson Jones, thank you so much for purchasing. Um, uh, yeah, Mayor, uh, I, I mean, yeah, Mayor's saying it, and I may all say, for, if you're like a hobbyist or, I can see situations where it's it seems expensive. I think, like I said, I'm I'm confident in the price for this. I had higher prices in mind. I had lower prices in mind, and I was like, this this seems right for what this tool unlocks. How powerful it is for people, and we've been working really hard on it. And this is the only way that Rocket Lasso makes money. So, in spite of the price tag on this being what I think this is worth for people, you're also supporting me, which means you're supporting my ability to do free live streams and to do free tutorials for everyone. So this is the business model. We do not do client work. We make tools for you so that your job is easier. And I just like making tutorials. So this enables it. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Jeff Webb is asking a very good question. And that is, what happens if you're sending the scene file off to someone who doesn't have a recall? Uh, well, two things to note. Um, that are important. If you send this off to somebody who doesn't have a recall and they open up the scene file, just like any plugin in cinema, it's going to yell at them saying like, hey, you don't have recall installed. So recall is not going to work for them. Now they could keep on working on the scene file and making changes and do whatever they want. As long as they don't delete anything with the recall tags, if they save the file, even with no recall, and then they send it back to you, your tags will still work and all the information will still be there. So that that still works. You, if you're going to send this off to a render farm, I'm just talking, so I guess I'll pop back on the screen. If you send this off to a render farm, the render farm might, the render farm will yell that, hey, there's no recall tag. But recall tag doesn't do anything at render time. Recall tag is a workflow tool. It only does something if the user says, I want to store, I want to recall. So if you send this off to someone else, they will be getting your scene file effectively in its current state. It's going to be to them exactly as it looks right now. Anything that's stored in a recall tag, they can't bring those back, but it still looks the way it did when you sent it. Now, if you send to a re if you send it to a render farm, if the render farm doesn't have recall installed, it might yell, it'll throw up a warning, but it's still going to render perfectly fine. The way, however it looks right now is the way it's going to render. So that also continues to work. Having said all that inside of recall, you could always delete your tags. Now I don't want to technically lose these, but I'm going to go ahead and click on a recall tag. If you're going to send it off to somebody, there's a button down here, which is remove all recall tags. And you could click that and it will go through the entire scene file, get rid of all the recall tags and all the information they have now been completely gotten rid of. If you save, it's all gone. Now I can hit undo and bring those back, but you can hit clear and all those are gone. And now you're free, obviously, to send it anywhere. And all of the extra information, everything that was stored is now gone. So that's something to note. Having said all of that, we are, it's not done yet, but we are going to be releasing a, oops, wrong button. Uh, oops. Man, I just clicked every wrong button. Um, it's not quite ready yet, but we're going to be releasing a recall read only version. And what the read only version means is that people, it'll be free. It'll be free. And it's for render farms and things like that, or for anybody, they will be able to install in the future, a recall read only version. And anything you create using recall, they will be able to restore. They'll be able to jump between recall tags and it won't it won't throw up a warning. The render farms will still work. They can't create new store states. They cannot record a new recall. They cannot override a recall tag, but they will be able to. You could make a tool for them and say, here's five lamps and one, and they could double click and jump between the lamps. That is coming soon. Uh, I just didn't, honestly, I just didn't want to. It's all but ready. I just didn't want to complicate the launch and be like, here's different flavors and different versions. So very soon we're going to be launching that and it should it should work. <laughs> Oliver, yeah, we've been. Um, We've been we've been trying to think through this very thoroughly. Like I said, 20 years of experience making plugins for cinema and I use cinema. So I only make tools that I think are useful, something that I want to exist. Um, how, uh, how's the website going? It's actually going really well. Uh, if I wasn't launching recall right now, then there's a good chance that the website would have just launched. But the last three weeks and remember, I said I couldn't do any more live streams um, for 
regular Rocket Lasso Live. It was because I had we had to get this out the door. Um, so, the, but the website is so close to done. I'm starting to put information, and it's it's. I, I really like the design. Um, Mr. Matt Dog, could you control recall tag states with Signal? Uh, no. Well, Signal can do things, some things that's not supposed to be able to do. I haven't tried. Essentially, that would be breaking recall, and we are not liable for anything that happens if you force something to trigger. But technically, Signal can sometimes drive parameters that don't have keyframes, but you shouldn't do that. And I mean, the, the main functionality here is the recall button, and Signal can't drive buttons. It can only drive objects pretty much that have keyframes. That's the idea. Um, let's see. Um, Carson Jones. I don't have a specific Redshift demo prepped. I do have other things to talk about. Um, uh, Brian, I can't speak too much to the workflow with takes because I don't use takes too often. Th this works with takes, but you can't, like I said, takes, when it comes to the Cinema 4D take system, it only, it doesn't like the hierarchy changing. And almost by definition, every time I double click on a recall tag, if I were to, should turn off a cloner, every time I double click on a recall tag, I've changed the hierarchy and takes doesn't like that. So I think you could be in any given state that you want, but the recall tags themselves will not, you know, you can't change a recall tag inside of the take system. So they're kind of like independent, but I don't think they fight with each other. Um, JM, what do you got? Uh, recall makes sense to me until you move tags between objects. Can I cover what's happening internally when you drag a tag between two different types of objects? Um, like, yeah, so you store on one object and then move it onto a different one. Let me see if I have... Actually, here, I've got a good demo for that. Um, just in case we did something like this here. So here is a car model that I made a couple years ago. It's not like a great car, but I've made it, I made it up and it's just for fun. Um, if I were to expand this, you can see it's an entirely parametric hierarchy. And let me see, grab like the body here, which where's the body? Turn off subdivisions. And you see like it's very clean model, a very clean model. Everything is parametric as I could possibly make it. And um, you know, I, I like it. It's not amazing, but it's fine. Now. This is back in the day when you can see right here, like the workflow I was doing, where I kept on hiding these different states. Now, I actually deleted a bunch of them and only kept the ones that made big differences. So you can see this is going from cube zero up to cube 29. So I had 29 different ones stored. I prepped this file so it's only showing like the six or seven like best ones. So anyway, that's the car. And let's go ahead and unhide all these other ones and show you some of the steps where it started. So actually, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later. But if I were to move this up, actually, this actually should be kind of cool. I can grab these different ones and move them out of the way. And you can see some of the different states. Like that's the first one I had saved. So like that, it started as a cube and then I turned it into that. And that eventually became that final car. So let's go ahead and change this instead of these being these individual objects. I want them all to be stored as tags now. So I will select all of them. Right click, recall, they've all got a recall tag. Click store, they've all been stored, all their individual informations are stored. And this tag now essentially has got all the information about this car. It doesn't matter that's on this car, It the tag itself is what's linking all the information, not the car. So that means I could move this anywhere I want to. I can move this onto a different object because it didn't care that it was on this, this object, it just cares that it is what it was when it was stored. So having done that, I could select all these recall tags, drag them all onto the main car, and now I am free to delete those original objects because those tags have the info. Hitting an A, so we can see this a little bit cleaner, I am now free to double click on this first one. And now you can see, even though I stored this I stored this one up in the air over here, and I stored this, this car over here, as I click through, you see that they're actually all in the middle now because recall, we haven't talked about it, but recall is automatically adopting the parent PSR by default. So it's actually jumping them to the exact same, you know, if they're at 000, then they're all jumping to 000. Just like when we made a null and I copied something to the null, it jumped to where that null was because of adopt parent PSR. But anyway, now I had all those different cars and they've all been stored and I can just double click through and see the different states the car was in at these different times. And they're just there. Their entire hierarchy is here. It's all free to just rapidly iterate through there. So um, I, I guess the way I dropped them, it's backwards from the way my brain works, where it's like, that's the newest and there's the oldest. But I could rearrange those if I wanted. I don't want to right now. Uh, let's click ABC. And now we're going to get them all automatically lettered going all the way back. And I'm free to jump around and make them go to any state I want. Now, if at some point, 
uh, I mean, it'd be crazy, but let's say I'm going to start working on another car. I could say, okay, make a new null, make, move the null in the air, grab H, the H step, make a copy, or even just drag it over. I'll just drag it over this time. Drag it over and say, double click. That null has now become whatever this H tag was storing. It was storing this particular bit of the car. So that, that has now jumped there. For anybody who's just jumping in, there is more organizing that you can do in recall. If you, right now we can name these tags however you like, but we can go into the notes tab and there's a bunch of information about what is stored. And here you can see it's a very complicated hierarchy because there's a lot of stuff inside of that car to make this one. But in the earlier version on H, you see it actually was very simple. So that's what's stored inside that one. So clicking on the A, so this, this, this actually, let's, well, I'm not going to, this is this car. I could double click and it's this car. But now that we're here, how about I zoom up really nice, frame it up as nicely as I want, click the render view button. And it's going to now take, it's going to essentially render a viewport renderer of whatever is in the viewport and put it in this view. And then I don't want to do all of them, but we could jump to the first state of the car and render that view. Go to that one, double clicking, render view. There's actually in the beta, there was a lot of requests of, of different ways of like storing. It, it was like, how, how can I change a property of it? I, like, what if I wanted to change one thing about this car? What if this car is supposed to be blue? How do I edit that? Like, I don't even think you have to think of it that way. Everything loads back in so quickly that if this, if F is supposed to be different in some way. Let's say it's got a blue material, just completely making this up. Let's say it's got a blue material. You don't go and edit some internal information. You just say, Hey, double click on F let's put on the blue material. And then I can click on F and say, okay, that's the new state of it. Let's, let's hit uh, render view. Let's go back to recall, click override. And now F has been overridden with the blue information. So I could click back on G and I click back on F and now it's come back again. Now it's back to that state. So if you want to update something about any given one of these tags, just double click on the tag, make a change and then override it. And you can jump between each of these different states and see exactly what was in there. I mean, it, it essentially remembers everything about what you did, it, even to the extent if I expand this hierarchy, if I store this, if I say override, I've now stored it again and then if I collapse it, if I double click, it'll actually come back as expanded. That's what it looked like when you saved it. So that's what's coming back. So you can be as organized as you want. And then if you need to override, just change the state, click override, and now it's back again. Uh, oh, Pete, 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 Pete. Uh, Pete Clear is asking a question about, uh, uh, Leo, are vertex maps stored? Yes, that's an easy question. Uh, Pete, I'm going to answer your question in a moment. Um, do you recall... Does recall store things like polygon selection tags too? Um, yes, it, it stores all the tags, so all the tags go along with it. Um, uh, Oliver actually has an excellent question there too. I'm not going to forget. I'm not going to forget your question, Oliver. But let me go and tackle. Um, oh my God! Look at all these questions coming in. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> and once again, if you happen to buy recall while the stream is going on, like put it in the chat. I love seeing it pop up because. Like I said, this is how we're making our living. So it's super duper important. Um, okay, so I, I guess we can tackle two questions in one. Pete is asking, can you nest recall? Like what about stepping down in the hierarchy? And the answer to that is yes. It's a, I'll, I'll even say it's kind of like a dangerous yes because of, I feel like mentally, like this is pretty clean. Like I, I understand what's happening here, but let's go ahead and make something new. And then also Pete was asking, how can you break a recall? Um... So, uh, let's see, I, I'm going to make just some nonsense here. So what if we make a cube and like I said, we can say, I want to store a recall tag just to be like, that's the beginning state of the cube. Now I'm going to make it editable, select all I for inner extrude, shrink these down, D for extrude. I'll pull those in I D and now we're, so we're just making some crazy shape there. Now, if I want to, I could. I'm going to move that over and now make a copy of the recall tag, override it by holding on control or command. And now let's put a subdivision surface and we'll drop that inside the subdivision surface. Now, in this case, I could say, you know what? I want to move these up there onto that object and I'll copy the tag and override it again. So now I could double click, double click, double click, and that's fine. What if, um, uh, let's, let's keep going on this. Uh, I'll subdivide it a little bit more. And then let's go and do something weird. Let, well, let's make a cloner. I'm gonna put this into a cloner now. And now there's a cloner doing its thing. We need a little more space between them. I'll say 300 by 300 by 300. So there we go. Those can all space out a little bit. Now let's put a recall tag onto the cloner. 
So now I've put this recall tag onto the cloner and that has stored that. Now what that is actually stored on this cloner is the cloner and the subdivision surface and the cube and the tags have now essentially been stored inside of this parent one. So I could right now, well, let's see, let's change some things. Well, I guess the good way of this is at any point I could say like, okay, actually I want, um, let's say five by five by two. So now I've changed that and I could go and double click on my cloner and jump back to the, whatever state I wanted when it was stored at that time. But I could go into this, let this lower recall tag and say, I want to go back a step. So now I've gone pre subdivision surface. Now I could jump back to the subdivision surface back to subdivision surface, but I can also jump out. So now you can see that because that's lower down, it didn't have any effect on the cloner because that's not part of this. It's not a child of cube. So yeah, that has that has recalled down here. I could go back to the original cube. Now here's where, so yes, you can do this. And we could keep on going higher and higher and higher in the hierarchy. Like this could go into a connect object and then the connect object could be in a null and I could put a recall tag on that. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to make it intentionally confusing just to show you that, yes, you can do this, but you start having to do mental gymnastics. So I'm going to put this to three by three by three, and it's just cute. So now we have cubes in a three by three by three inside a connect, and now I'll store a recall tag on that. But keep in mind, this recall tag is now like, well, what I have inside is a connect and a cloner with a recall and a cube with a recall and a recall and a recall. That's what's inside there. So I could say, okay, I want to jump back to, let's say the polygon version. But if I double click on this cloner, that's actually going to jump it back to the cloner state. But also you see it went back to the subdivision surface because that's what that was stored at the time when this cloner was created. So if I make a bunch of changes to, I'm trying to think of what the bad version of this is. If I were to double click on this upper recall tag, it's actually going to jump back to the state where that was created. But you see, it's kind of in a way it's killed off any changes we made to the children. So, but I could double click on the children and jump back to those various states, but only up to the point where that tag was created. I guess here's the example of where you could lose something if you, if you don't keep it organized in your head would be if I make a copy of recall and I override it. So now you can see I've made a new recall tag here, but that recall tag did not exist when this tag was created. So if I recall to that state, this tag did not exist at that time. So if I say, Hey, load, that tag is gone and it's effectively gone forever. So I could hit undo and get back to that one. And I could rescue this tag. I could move it up to the upper level. But keep in mind that is just storing this cloner. But this tag only knows what it looked like at that time. So anything you change child wise, that goes away if you override it. So, but yes, you can very, very, very much do recallception all the way down. It, it can get insane. Um, so typically I don't go too many levels deep. Uh, and, and soon we'll talk about a couple of extra features that that actually you could do something a little bit more like this and it's more reasonable. But hopefully that answers your question, Pete, which was a that, that's a fine caveat. Um, now, Oliver had a very good question. And essentially in the help documents, I mentioned that there's uh, that recall can show a broken state. Now, it's actually very simple to show you what happens and how this can break. So if I were to let's just make this. Uh, cube editable. Actually, you know, I'll do something even more fun. Um, I've got some happy toolbox models loaded up here. And if you don't know happy toolbox, um, they make really cool stylized models and I've got a bunch of different ones. So let's go and grab a, um, what's something, Ooh, tree bench. I like this. So you, he, there's these really great, these models. So uh, actually I'll pull up the thing on the screen. So you should head on over to happytoolbox.com if you like to look at these models and he's got a bunch of different ones and it's really fun. Um, I do like these a lot. So we've now got a model. It's actually really clean where there's not too much in here. You see the hierarchies are very clean as far as it could be built. So uh, let's break this though. So the goal here, unfortunately, is to break it. So if I were to say, I want to store a recall on here, I can store that. That's now stored and I could even make a copy and make some sort of modifications. Maybe I don't want these apples on there. So I could go to object mode and say, like, oh, because the subdivision surface is on, it's overriding, but I could say no apple, 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 apple. And I could just like delete a bunch of those. And then now this new recall tag, I can turn back on subdivision surface and store it that way. So now I've got two, two different states there. Now with recall, if you copy it, so I've now copied it to my clipboard. And if I open up a new file, I can paste it. 
And if I paste it, then the tree comes in just fine. Here's everything. All the information has been brought over. But because of the nature of Cinema 4D, the, the only way we could do this, the only way we could copy and paste between scene files is when you hit paste. Let me step through here and explain. It, when I hit paste, what's happening is this object is coming in and then the recall tags come in and the recall tags go, hey, we're recall tags. What are we storing? And they're like, we don't know what we're storing. And what they have to do is go and find the other scene file and be like, oh, that's what I'm storing. And it brings all the information over. So as far as I know, the only way to break a recall tag is if I, I guess, this, yeah, this will fully break it. If I go back to the original tree file, I'm going to copy it. And now this is what you should never do. This is what you should never do with recall is I've copied it. And if I close the scene file, then that is now closed. If I open up a new scene file and I hit paste, you're going to see two broken recall tags because those recall tags suddenly exist and they go, oh, we exist. What are we supposed to be? Go find the scene file. That scene file doesn't exist anymore in, inside of the open documents. And so they're like, oh, I don't know what I am. Oh, I broke. Now, the other scene file that was saved, all the information is still there and everything fine. But copy it. Essentially, the, the one rule with recall is don't copy close the scene file and paste. Just make sure the old scene file is open and that's the only thing to worry about. And I think it's the only way to break recall. So there you go. That's how you break it. Um, <laughs> and everybody uh, everybody in the Twitch stream just ignored Nightbot when he's being annoying. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do a poll later and ask everybody what they think of uh, Nightbot and if we should keep it around. Uh, so yeah, definitely recallception is super fun. Uh, so keep on coming with any recall questions that you might have. And once again, if you happen to purchase recall, make sure you shout it out in the chat so I can thank you. So let's see. Okay, so I've got more demo files that we have not gone over yet. Uh, oh, here's a fun one. Okay, so I'm going to open up this. And it's actually a funny demo, but I'm going to do a whole little cinema uh, dynamics demo here for you. This car actually comes in the content browser. So I'm not sure. I don't remember where it lives, but somewhere in the content browser that is in there. So if you if you download the um, optional content packs from Maxon, then you will have this car. So anyway, here's this car and I want to smash it. I want to use dynamics and cr and have a crash. OK, so here's the thought. What if uh, we need a low poly version of this? Um, so the best way to do that now is we have our volumes. So let's create a volume builder and inside that volume builder. I'm just going to, let's be as sloppy as we can drag in the entire sedan and with any luck that should hopefully do something. I thought it would do something. Yeah, do, do. I mean, the models in there, volume builder, volume measure. Yeah, it's a builder that should work. What am I doing wrong there? Hmm. I didn't think I'd bump into that. And it's got nothing to do with signal or with uh with recall. Well, let me try. I'm gonna lock that and then drag in these sub objects. Maybe it's just calculating. Do I just need to go to time? Oh, I think it is just calculating. It's a there's a lot of model here, so maybe I was just being impatient. This is um I got to wait until I can rotate my camera. So let's just give it some time. It's a big, complicated model. It needs to calculate. Um, do, 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 do. Copy, delete, and paste. Copy, delete, and paste. Uh, Mo, actually, now that you ask it, like it, going back to the previous question, like about closing the scene file, if you were to copy, delete. Oh, no, you can copy, delete, paste within a single scene file. You just can't go between scene files. Is this building? And yeah, I can't rotate my camera. Link to a fresh camera. Yeah, it's. I think it is calculating the volume. Maybe, okay, you know what? If this is gonna be really slow, I'm just gonna open up the scene file where I already built the volume. Um, so just give me a quick moment, but cinema is not uh, cooperating right there. Uh, recall, demo files, car smash. Okay. Okay, so we've missed a step here, which is, um, I'll delete that and let's see if this one actually works. It's the same scene file here. And like I said, that's from the content browser. If I were to, let's see if this works. I'm gonna double click on that recall tag. And now you see the volume builder comes back. So I had saved it within the builder. 
And then if I turn off the mesh deformer, yeah. So I don't know why the other one's not cooperating, but you can see that I, I had fed, I fed the sedan into this and then it made a big blob of a car, but it's pretty reasonable low poly. And then I stored it as a recall tag. And now if I, I'm just going to hit undo. So then I made it editable because I had to make a couple tweaks and I, it's going to take too long, but I did some tweaks where I like pulled the mirrors out. So that mesh was out on the outside and I pulled this thing up for the antenna. Anyway, the point being is that's a volume mesher. And it's just a nice, actually, why don't we, we will do these steps. I'll delete those, delete those. Delete those. Okay. So you can see that I've now got a, just a blob, a blob of a car. And now I could create a mesh deformer, which are really cool. Create a mesh deformer, drop it inside the car, drag this volume mesher inside of it under advanced. Make sure you turn on surface or area and then click initialize and it will initialize the state there and turn it into a surface that can be deformed. Now I can put on and, you know, just for fun, because we have fun here in the live stream. Uh, I can right click on the volume mesher and add on a simulate soft body tag. And you know what? Actually, let's not even look at the car yet. We'll leave this running a little faster. So you can see I've got just got this blob of a blob of a car. It's got a soft body on. So if I hit play, you can see that that blob is going to start falling, and then it will hit the ground. And it's just a soft body, so you see it's going to squish and everything. So I could have some fun with this though, and we can say, how about it's really stiff? So under soft, well, first of all, I'm going to say ignore self collisions. It'll just run a little bit quicker. Under soft body, I'm going to say tons of stiffness on this thing, like 111 and damping. There could be lots of damping. So it's going to really drain the energy out. But the important thing here is elastic limit. If I make a low elastic limit of like one, and I'm going to do the same with flexion. I want it really strong, but I'm going to give it a low elastic limit. So I'll say five. So the thought here is when it smashes, it's going to stay smashed. In order to see it smash better, I will turn on dynamics custom initial velocity and let's fling it at the ground at let's say negative 1500 and i don't know which rotation it is so let's try saying negative i don't know 500 on rotation and let's hit one frame forward to make sure it's not too crazy okay it's going sideways not the worst thing in the world but i want it to go forward so let's say minus 500 there one let's go on backwards so we'll just do positive so let's do positive three 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 that might work so frame frame Okay. And something I always do with dynamics is I always go one frame at a time because I never know how slow it's going to be. But you can now see I'm smashing in the ground. But what's cool is you see how the damage stayed there. It is now permanently smashed. If I rewind, it jumps back here. So now that that's working, I could unhide the car. And this volume mesher is doing its thing. So if I hit play, it's going to lag a frame behind, but it would render correctly. If I hit play, oop, let's turn on the mesher. So that's that mesher that we made. Hit play. The car is now forced to do anything that that low volume thing is doing. And now you see the car goes down, it gets smashed, and then this ball can crush it. And any damage the car takes, it will remember that damage, which is really cool. I love, I love being able to build this kind of thing. But when you're playing with dynamics, there's a lot of ways of breaking dynamics. And when if you break... <sighs> You never know when you're going to break dynamics, and there's a lot of different ways of breaking them. I happen to know a way of breaking them. So this is a demo showing you how to break your dynamics. You never want to do this. But here's where recall comes in, because obviously today's all about recall. And the way recall comes in is if I make a copy of this tag, so it's a new recall tag, and just override it. So what that's doing is storing the dynamics tag. It's storing the current mesh. Everything about that has now been stored. So if I hit play, the car will go down, and it will smash, and it's nice and broken. So that's fine. It's working well. And let's do it again. And this time I'm going to break it. I'll show you how to break it and never do this. <laughs> but you can now see it's a broken car. But if I were to accidentally, let's say I, I have this mesh selected and I'm at the time of 11. If I accidentally click in the viewport and drag my mesh just a little bit, if I just like click and move, like just a tiny little click and move, I have now accidentally permanently broken the mesh. So that's just one way I know of breaking. If I rewind, you can now see that this car is smashed at frame zero. If I go one frame forward and one frame back, try and force a refresh, no. Hit the letter A, force a refresh, no. It is broken. It is utterly broken. And you've probably run into this before, in, into this before when you're playing with dynamics. It can happen to splines. It can happen to meshes. Um, 
and it and in this case you can see it happens because you manipulate the points in some way not at the time of zero and it's permanently broken the only way to get this back honestly is to load your scene file to some earlier state which is always risky or to um hit undo but you can't just hit undo to before you dropped it you have to hit undo until the moment that this mesh was created and everything after that none of that will fix it you have to undo until it was created but we just stored this thing with recall. So if I were to double click on the recall tag that we just made, it brings it right back again. We stored the state of the car at that moment. And if I hit play, the car goes back down. It still smashes, it breaks, rewind, and it's fixed. Recall not only saved the model of this object and the tag, all the information about it, it went into the mesher, found that this is where the car was linked, and it swapped that out for the one we just restored. So there was a bad one. We killed it off and replaced it with the good one. Now, this is just to illustrate that I, another place I'm going to be using recall all the time. And in fact, this is literally, I think that playing with dynamics is when I was like, man, I really wish there's a really easy way for me to save this without making a copy of the hierarchy because all the time other things are linked all over the place and and you know every time if i were to break that mesh i have to undo a lot and i have to fix the mesher and i have to reinitialize there's a lot of steps just to fix this simple setup but now whenever i go and make any kind of dynamic setup i can automatically store the state when it's like okay cool that's the state i want it to be in store it and boom it is stored and i can always jump back to it um, so that is a solve for that. Uh, most triumphant question. How do you deal with dynamics working best on a certain? Um, I think that is a not recall question. So triumphant today is a live stream all about my new plugin recall. So we're not taking random questions today, but maybe next week. Um, let's see. So yeah, any other recall questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. Make sure you do a shout out if you pick it up because I want to give you a big thank you if you do. And I've got more demo files to show. Let me make sure I'm in the right folder. And let's see, what else do I have? Well, just here's just some random examples of like workflows I, I do or states that I might keep it. Here's a dice. I actually made this as a demo for recall and it just ends up being kind of nice. And I think I'm going to make this file available on Patreon. And as I mentioned earlier, if you are on Patreon already, then you can get a coupon to get recall for cheaper. But this was just a model of some different dice. And if you play Dungeons and Dragons, you're very familiar with all these dice. And I've got a D4 and I can double click and get a D6, 8, 10, 12, and 20. And they're all modeled super duper clean, like as few polygons as possible, as clean as I could possibly make it. And they're all just there ready to rock. And I can just double click on any one of them and get it. Now I marked those all in orange, but I also have these gray ones. And these gray ones are the parametric version of these dice. So if I double click, I can actually go back to the state where these were parametric. And actually, look, you can see this is an instance where I did have a recall tag inside of it because I was worried about losing the state there. So they actually stored one inside and I could always change the state of that as well. So there is the parametric D4. You see the whole hierarchy making it. I can go all the way up to the D20, load that one. You can see how this one is built out with all these bevels and details and just keeping everything as clean as possible. I think I made each of the, actually, yeah, see that's, is that what I did? Cloner and then all of those. If I double click on that. Yeah, okay, even interesting. So in the D20, because I, I made this a, you know, a little while ago, Inside of the D20, I stored the um, inside of the D20. I stored the um, the entire state of the hierarchy, and then the um, let me pop this open before I forget. Yeah, inside of the D20, I stored an internal recall tag and then I went and made it editable and then went through on all the polygons. I had to clean up a bunch of things for the bevels because unfortunately text ends up being really clunky. So I had to go, go to all the different edges and like really clean up some corners so that the bevels could actually successfully be manipulated on it. And so I even stored the state there before I made that bit editable just to be sure that that would end up popping through and working all the way. So let me get this one. Bloop. 
Uh, questions. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna make the scene file available on Patreon. Bing, bing. It's really fun running dynamics on these because they're they're so clean that you can actually just run the full dynamics on that. It's really nice. Uh, Scott, I am going to be posting this. Uh, well, I mean, it will be available on YouTube, but I've also got I've got some of these demos. I'm, I'm doing more here, especially there's a bunch of questions, but um, I will be doing more demos. Or I've got some full videos I'm going to be releasing for all the help files, and I've got a quick start. There's like a 35 minute long video where I really kind of meticulously go through a bunch of things. Uh, Dean, uh, how about using recall and uh, using a cached item? Um, that's a good question. Uh, well, uh, so essence, a <laughs> good name, essence. Um, that's a good question. Um, can or how is recall installed? And it's actually installed really easily, which is you just go into your edit preferences. There's two different ways of installing things. There's two official ways that Maxon says you should install things. One would be clicking your open preferences folder and then dropping it into the plugin folder. Or you can go to your plugins flyout here and you can go and activate. You can uh, navigate to wherever your recall folder is stored. So you say add folder and you go navigate to it and it's in here. You restart cinema and it's loaded. So you can just you can put it anywhere on your hard drive and then link to it via this. So it's super duper easy to install. We could have made fancy installers, but honestly, I think people uh, installers can be a little weird. So I figured people I trust people to be able to copy and paste it into the folder. Uh, scene files. I've got more here. Milk crate. I got a couple different things I modeled recently just for fun. So like, here's a milk crate I modeled. You see, I started out with a plane and after the plane and I, I really did this. I was using this is where I was using recall. And I then moved on to here. So using the knife tool, I went to this step and you'll see that I actually have two planes as one model because I kept on going to a side view and I made them into one model because all of these kind of interact by these corners where they meet. So I was being really meticulous with the way I did that. And then I can step through to step three where I added the handle and then where I merge that surface in. And now they perfectly match up with those. And then where I clone is actually the parametric version where I clone it and connect it into all these corners. And then I didn't like that. So I actually went back a step, made more changes and then moved forward again. And then I got rid of those holes and then I cleaned that up and extruded. So now I end up with this shape Try And there's a lot of cleanup I'm doing everywhere where like certain polygons weren't, weren't working too well. Right, that looks bad, but it was fine. But now you can jump to another step and you can just see as I go further, I'm refining even here. It's subtle, but you can see there's a lot of little tweaks and cleanups I do where I'm removing unnecessary points and polygons and then I make a floor and then I add in here's the parametric version where you can see I, I made some bools and there's some bevels and everything's getting extruded and er erasing out this hole and each step is like oh I don't want I want to be able to go back there in case I need to but then finally in step 14 I bake that all down and now I've just got the model if I want to I could turn on this bevel and now there's the beveled version of this milk crate, all modeled step by step by step. And I was able to keep everything super clean and I can jump back. And this is actually an example where all the time I had to jump back to like step two because I needed to go reference this shape. So in this case, I might do something like create a null. I want to go back to step 14, but I'm going to take step two, put it out on this null and say, null, you are actually step two now. And I can bring that back and it's, it's there. I can delete this copy of the tag and that just exists for me to continue doing anything I want with it. And I can go back and reference and make sure that everything's lining up properly with a hole or whatever the case is. So that's like a, a super real world example of me going through. Uh, Meeks, how big is the scene file? Uh, this specific scene file of everything stored is, let me make sure there's nothing shouldn't be shown. Nope, it's clean. So here is the scene file and it is about three megs. So very small. Um, it should literally be the exact size of as if they were all copied again and again and again, because, but keep in mind, parametric objects are really small because cinema doesn't need to store much information about this. But once you make something editable, then now there is information stored about the UVs, information about the points and the polygons and how they're all combined. So baked down models are a lot bigger. I mean, you know this, if a baked down model is way bigger than a parametric model. So, um, and it's as if every single one of those was living in the scene, but it doesn't play back like they're living in the scene. It plays back as if we're only seeing this final model. Uh, Pro Tools, that's a good question. Recall works back to version 18. So if you have 18, 19, 20, 21, or 22, then Recall works on Mac and PC. 
Blue Tone Blue just bought Recall. Thank you so much, Blue Tone. I appreciate it. And let me know if you make anything cool with it. I've also opened the ideas for future versions. I've been writing down a list. The beta testers had various ideas. There's different organizational tools and things. And like people are saying, like if there would be some way to transition between two, that would be cool. Um, so I'm thinking about workflows of how that might work. Um, back to Dean's question about cached items. This is not something I've played with a lot. And cinema can be a little bit twitchy there. So I will say I'm a little worried about demoing this, but why not? Uh, we already had Cinema Freak out. We'll just do using the volume, so we will do it. Um, I've got a scene here. This is another scene, and we'll probably do a bunch of this from scratch. So you can see I've got these crates, but let's build those from scratch because why not? Delete the crate. I've got the cloner, but once again, Happy Toolbox has a bunch of really cool models. And let's see, where are these? Uh, I think that they might be in City, or maybe they're in Yeah, in City, um, there is a really nice wooden crate and actually, I'm going to bring in this palette as well, because I really I, I really like these kind of mechanical things. On a live stream I did recently, we spent a, a whole bunch of time just in Pinterest trying to think of a whole collection of not spheres. Like, what are things we can do? If you're going to make a bunch of copies of some, something, what is something that could be that's not a sphere? And it, you're coming up with things like marbles. and Well, not marbles. The marble is a terrible idea, but it was more like smooth out glass and donuts. and uh, But uh, like a crate and a palette, those are two great not spheres. So anyway, here is a wooden crate, and you can see that it is subdivided. Let me hit N, B. So you can see it's subdivided a bunch, um, which is nice. We're going to be running Dynamics, and just for the live stream, actually, in all my tests, I left this full power. But actually, I am going to bake this, or I'm going to turn off the subdivision surface just so we can run the Dynamics really quickly. And how about right-clicking and adding a recall tag? So it's like what it looks like originally. And then I will make a connect object. And I want to bake this down. I will say connect objects, they actually do this to everything. Any tags that's on a connect object, when you make it editable, it destroys them. So if I want to keep this recall tag, I'm actually going to pull it off to the palette for a moment, then make this editable, and then move it back onto the connect so it doesn't kill it off. And then we can delete that. And now we've got this connect. I'll name it crate again. I do love a connect object, but sometimes it can be a pain. So now I've got a baked down version, so I'll store another one. So as the basic use case for recall is always, now I have the parametric one, and here's the baked down one as a single object. So now that we've done that, I'll make it a child of this cloner. And now you can see I get a whole bunch of copies of it. Hit NA, make it nice and smooth. And with all these copies, there is a dynamics tag. So a couple things, let's see, did I set a custom on this? Yeah, I did. Okay, it's actually pretty simple right now. So it's just a, I'll just do it from scratch instead of explaining it. So right clicking on the Cloner, I can add a simulation rigid body. I don't want the shape to be automatic because then it's going to be way too detailed. I'm going to say, hey, the shape, they're just boxes. They're all cubes. So now these can be treated as cubes, which should make them run relatively quickly. So hopefully if I play, there we go. You can see they're running nice and fast. We got these crates and they're falling and hitting the ground. I think it looks, I, I mean, that's working fine. But let's say I want to tinker around with some different dynamic simulations. Um, so... As I, let's say, let's say that's a good baseline. I don't want to lose this. So let's right click and add a recall tag. But this time, let's actually, we almost never change any settings, but let's change a couple settings this time. I don't want to store the hierarchy. By default, when we store, it's storing based on these defaults. So it's storing keyframes and the hierarchy and the object. But I'm going to say, I do want the object, but I'm not worried about the hierarchy or the keyframes. And what this means in this case is we are only storing the cloner and all of its tags and the children will be unaffected. So if I were to store that by double clicking, I've now stored the cloner in its current state and the dynamics tag in its current state. So what that means is I'm free to play around some more with that with the dynamics. So let's say a custom initial velocity and let's fling these at the ground really hard. So let's say like minus 555 and hit play. And then you can see that it got a little acceleration. Actually, I like that almost right away, where it's like you get this, they all look pretty static, and then there's one that falls down for emphasis. So I thought I'd have to try a little bit harder to be a nice looking one. But let's just say that flinging that down a little bit like that is like, okay, like the shot's beginning, and it's like it's going to cut in. It's just like, boom, and that's what the shot is, and then they fall. It's like, hey, I like that simulation. I don't want to lose it. So I'm not actually caching anything yet, but if I were to make a copy of that tag and then override it, I've now stored just the cloner and just these tags. So what that means is I could keep on playing with my simulation settings. So let's say it flings it down at the ground harder, minus one, 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 and one, 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 one. And let's give it a little bit of spin. 
I'm not sure what angle it's on. Yeah, so now you can see they're really getting flung. They all fall over. Let's say I didn't like that so much. So let's put a little bit more spin on it in a different orientation. I'll say, okay, that one's actually pretty cool. I like that one stack in the middle. That's got some nice emphasis. Maybe the client would like to see that one. So let's make another copy of our recall tag and override by clicking the override button or holding down control. If you're on a Mac, hold down command and double clicking. You see a new color appears. It's now been overridden. And now I have this particular these settings, not the simulation, but those settings in there. And that means I could double click on the first one and we want to hit play. Actually, um, oh, I, I forgot this is actually an important thing. So you can see that I've got these recall tags, but currently if we say replace, remember a recall tag replaces everything. It replaces everything inside the hierarchy. We don't want it to do that. So I'm going to select all three of these recall tags. I'm going to say, you know what? When you recall, don't replace the children. So I'm going to say, don't replace children. So now when I double click on, well, let's look at, we're on this third simulation. So if I play, they bounce and they all fall in. There's one stack that stays. Let's rewind and double click on the first one. And now you'll see that it, it recalled, but the crate wasn't affected. Only the cloner was. So if I hit play, now we're back to that really gentle one. Let's double click on the middle one. And if I rewind, now they all fall and the one stack falls over. I can double click on the last one. And you see, I'm actually being really dangerous with this. I'm clicking, I'm double clicking while it's playing dynamics because I trust the setup. Um, so now you can see I can double click on the third one and we get the them all falling over when it was just this one stack falling. So it's not cash, but it is all these different simulations. And keep in mind that this cloner is, it's not changing the settings. It's actually, it's taking out the cloner, grabbing the children, putting the children into the cloner, bringing back the different recalls tag. Like it's, it's actually swapping this stuff out. So it's actually doing a lot behind the scenes, but I can grab every single one of those. Now, having said that, I'm pretty sure we could do a cache. I haven't done this too much, but I'm pretty sure we could go and do a quick like MoGraph cache tag um, and bake that. And you can see a little bit of the inspiration for the recall tag. I did make mine from scratch, but let's uh, bake that and it'll play through the simulation. So now I'm free to scroll and you can scroll forward and scroll backward. And that was, we're currently on the third simulation. And I can tell because that's the little white corner icon or the, you know, the little white symbol on the corner of the icon. So I can click on that one override. So now I'm storing again. It's as if I made a new one. So now I can double click on, let's say the first tag. And now you can see the cache tag is gone. It's not there anymore. This is a live simulation. But if I double click on the third recall tag, the cache has come back. The cached dynamics tag has come back. And now if I just scrub, you can see that that cache came back along with recall. Now, that the f it's not like it's magically disappearing that information. Like that information still lives. If the cache is huge, recall is storing a huge cache. Like that's not going to go away. Um, but we are now free to have cached something, bring it back, try a different one, bring it back, and we can just iterate through those different ones as we go. So yeah, that's, that is that. Uh, Pixel Brain, like, I guess along those lines, like, yeah, if you have a two gig Cinema 4D file, um, if you store, if you, if you were to, if you have a two gig file, well, you, you're saying you have a two gig file, but let's say you have a single model and that single model is a hundred megs. If you put a recall tag and store it, it's now storing a hundred megs worth of information. So you've got the original model and a copy of it stored there now. So now you do have a 200 meg file, but if you were to take 10 nulls and then copy the recall tag onto those 10 nulls, so there's 10 copies, of the same tag, you are still at 200 megabytes. It's not every tag is not bigger. As long as you don't override it, then every copy of the tag is just referencing the same information that was stored. So yeah, you can have a bunch of recall tags. So like if we store the lamp, all those different tags are not another copy of all the information on the lamp. They are all, um, they're going to be uh, just references to the other one. So it only has to store it one time. Hopefully that answers uh, your question. So let's see. Um, yeah, blue tone. <laughs> well, you, you picked it up. So let, let me know if you end up having any problems, but I, I am confident in recall. Uh, okay. So hit me up with more questions. If you have any, um, let's see. Yeah, that's a cash question we just hit. So I've got a couple more demo files here. And like I said, we'll keep going for as long as people have questions. Uh, here is, this is similar to the car idea, but going back a little ways, I was, I was, I was really in the mood to do modeling. I was modeling some different characters and this is actually the one I got furthest with. So this was pre recall, but I went and I, 
loaded a whole bunch of the scene files I had made and I brought them all in the same scene file and I stored the different states into recall so I could actually reference all of them as I go. So now I started out with this model this way. So I just had a probably a, a reference of a female form and I traced out where I thought the polygon flow would be good. And then I got to this state. So it's an A and then I got to this state and then this state, this state, this state here and there all of this model completely from scratch so and i mean a lot of this was an exercise in like getting like really good edge flow and you can see this one's pretty parametric you see i was trying to make it as clean as i could get like really nice joints for the knuckles and just um being able to model everything so it's really fun being able to or you know just going through and, and practicing and going through and even improving because every time i go and model something i always kind of forget modeling techniques and you can actually see how like how much worse the model is early on. And I keep on refining, like here it's pretty rough. And like the anatomy here, like how sharp the definition here, it's like pretty questionable. But then as I kept on looking at more reference and then changing it up, you see how it improved. So it's really fun to be able to archive something like this and bring back any part. And then at any point I could make more changes and be like, oh, I, I need to go back to an older state. Or let's say I bake things down. I'm like, oh, wait, I remember an H that the eyeballs were there. And I can tell because if I click on the H tag, go back to the notes, I could scroll down and be like, um, oh yeah, there's like the eyebrow and then somewhere in there, there's the eye. So I'd be, oh, that's got the eye. So then even if I was on some other thing, I'd be like, oh, I want that eyeball. Let's make a null, pull the H tag onto the null that becomes that. And now I could say, oh, the null was rotated. Um, or I'm sorry, the model was rotated. Like I said, it always adopts to the PSR, but now I could go and copy the eyes and then put the H tag back there delete that and paste. And now I was able to get the eyeballs back from whatever states that they had originally been in. Creepy. So yeah, really fun to be able to archive this. Yeah, so I think this model, I probably had it rotated. Yeah, you see Z is up and Y is backwards. So when I copied it from the old file, it was a bad idea, but it always adopts the new position. Do I have, do you have to transfer to a null to copy the bits from one tag to another? Well, I mean, we're not, ta we're not copying bits from one tag to another. It's just like, it's a philosophy of everything is stored in a tag. Let me open up another model. Here's a sword. This is actually just in case I, I just modeled, I was making this as a demo for recall and I ended up not going anywhere with it. But I was like, well, it's a cute sword anyway. So, um, so it's more like I'm going to store this here and now it's stored in the tag. So I'm free to go and change this model however I want without fear of, let's see. Oh, these are even super parametric. So I, I can change all this without fear of breaking my original model. So this is just straight up cinema stuff. And here's a bool not cooperating too much, but there you go. We get that and I could grab the little fork handles. And I think this is, yeah, tons and tons of parametric stuff. So I could stretch these out even further so i can make all these changes and be confident that i've got this all stored in this recall tag and i can jump back to it at any point that i want to so the idea of like oh do you have to copy this over to some other object to get it back and, and the answer is yes i mean technically maybe we could do a feature where you could make a button where there's a button which is like copy to object and, and that's, you know, maybe that's an idea for the future. But to me, there's barely a difference between that and making a null. I mean, OK, I'll make a copy of the tag, double click. And now that null has become whatever the tag was. And that tag was the entire sword. So we've gotten one back in that original state. And that's the current workflow. If people really want like some other modified one, then that's, that's potentially a version 1.1 or 1.5 type of thing. But yeah, I, I just copy it over. It's just... It's the way my brain naturally works, but if that's not the way other people think, then it's a tweak that could be made. And really fun to make variations of this type of thing. So um, that's still storing and get rid of that. But this one's storing the original, but here's a second one. And I can click to number these if I wanted to. And then we could just keep on modifying different variations of the sword. So maybe this one's got like a bigger ring on the bottom. And maybe the blade gets way bigger. And then this crystal... That should be larger. So we can just keep on like making different swords and I'd be like, okay, store that one. And I'd be like, okay, which one do we like? Then we like that one. Do we like that one? Do we like that one? And I, I don't know. I just love being able to jump between those. And I, like, what, keep in mind, like the information's in these tags. So this, this object's got nothing to do with it. So even though like, as I click, it feels like maybe this Taurus is being modified. It's not. This Taurus goes away 
and is replaced entirely by what's inside the tag. So like, yeah, this feels like these are all here, but I could delete them and then double click. And now they're back again. It's got nothing to do with them existing here. Uh, I would allow uh, <laughs> pro tools. That is totally true. I mean, look at, we did not use adopt parent PSR. We have not talked about adopt child PSRs and we haven't talked about keyframes or hierarchy. Um, and it just goes to, it's a workflow. It's about all about how this is going to be useful to you. So, and the tricky bit goes to, or not the tricky bit, the fun part, the, the part that makes this very easy to demo is that we do have a incredibly simple double click workflow. At any point, the simple pitch of like store by double clicking and then, you know, make changes at any point, double click and bring it back. Like that's 99% of the way that I think everybody's going to use it day to day. There's a lot more ways to use it. But that's the 99% one. Uh, important to note, you can always click this question mark button and it will jump to the help page. I'm going to dangerously click that. And okay, it did indeed work. So that will jump to the help page and you can scroll through. And I'm going to actually, I haven't publicly released these like on social media yet. But this video here, I, I think is a really good video. It's 35 minutes long and it goes through a lot of what we just talked about. Um, and then there's the install video. Here's the double click workflow video, customizing your icon, staying organized with the notes tab, changing default settings, re using recall to replace other objects. And a lot of these are pretty short. So just like short and sweet. So here's object hierarchy and keyframe modes, which we really haven't talked about. And here's relink to external, which we talked very briefly about adopt PSRs and replace children options. And then here's an, a breakdown of the different icons. Here's some FAQ questions. So yeah, you can just click the help button and then it should hopefully have all the information. And if there's ever like a problem or a bug, then at the very bottom, there's a contact for email, right? We're still a new company. So, oh, link please. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, it does link to it. If you go to the page, it's not hidden. Um, uh, hang on. Oh, I just closed it. So I'll just click the button again. Um, if you go to just the recall purchase page, then there's links to it. Um, but here is a direct link over to that. But yeah, if you go to the recall, like sales page at the bottom, there's links to the training page. So for YouTube and for Twitch, there is the link to the help page to watch through all those extra videos. Um, yeah, no more. I can't recall excuses. Um, well, they don't have to know what it is. Um, would be nice to toggle a live update mode on the current selection tag so you can quickly jump back to an earlier state to the most recent. I'm not sure I'm following intelligent machine. The, um, like a live update mode. Oh, I think I do know what you mean. You mean state most recent. I think you're saying that it's almost like you'd want an, a recall tag to automatically get generated like every five minutes or something or every every 50 clicks generate a recall tag. That's an interesting idea. Um, this is, uh, re send me a message to remind me of that. That's an interesting idea. The idea of like recall tags slowly appearing as you're working and you'd be like, oh, there's that one. There's that one. If somebody wanted that, I could, I could see it. I would never have something like that on by default. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for purchasing. That is deeply appreciated. And I hope it dramatically improves your workflow and speeds everything up for you because that's the goal. It's going to speed everything up for me. And I, I meant for anybody who's not here, I mentioned that soon, not long from now, we're going to be releasing a recall read only version. So other people who don't have recall could still bring things back. They just couldn't store new states. And the reason one of the big, actually, you want to know one of the big reasons we're doing that is I wanted it so that you could do that for like coworkers and render farms that don't have recall so that they could have it and it won't yell. But another big reason was I, I'm going to be using recall in a lot of my live streams because I think it's a really great tool. I want everybody to have it, but it's also just a really good workflow. Like I'm going to be using it because like, uh oh, we're about to bake something down. Let's make a backup of it. We're about to do something dangerous with dynamics. Let's back it up. Um, and I want when I give people because on, on Patreon, I give away the scene files and I want people to be able to load them. So there'll be essentially a free read only version of recall. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Hang on. I lost my folder with examples. Pull this back up again. What else do we have? Any more questions? Uh, Brawley has just made his very first recall tag. Um, 
So anyway, how many episodes will recall season have? <laughs> Uh, well, I was, my brothers were asking how long the stream was going to be today. And I said, as long as people are asking questions, I'm going to keep on going. So it's either it's, it's the breaking point is going to be how long until like I need to stop for some water or something. And what's funny is I can do like these two or three hour long streams and not even like take a sip of water. I've got my cup right here and I pretty much never do. Um, and yeah, read only. Yeah, Leo, I, I think it's also a good marketing tool, but it, it is just it just adds more functionality. So, and it's use it's absolutely <clears throat> it's absolutely useless unless somebody made something with the recall tag. So the read only is is just a good bonus. Uh Carson, uh we talked about it a little bit earlier, the copy paste. Um the copy paste between scene files, just make sure if you copy something, go to a new scene file and paste. Don't close the old scene file before you paste the new one because the the recall tags can't pull the information over if you do. Um, so that's pretty much the one gotcha. And then the other thing is just the nested recall tags. If you make a lot of tags, it can, it turns into an, it turns into inception. I mean, it really does. It's almost one of the most direct parallels because at a certain point you're like, this tag is storing everything that the children were by changed something in the children. So that's not in the parent. So I knew, need a new tag on the parent. So if you start really nesting them, you can end up with a fairly confusing looking scene file. Um, but that's just, that's just workflow at that point. Um, let's see, I'll pull up some of the final example files and see if any more questions. Yeah. Geo within geo within geo, um, low graph tree card dice, elephant sculpting. Um, yeah, this was just, uh, this is, I, there's a very recent live stream that I, or I'm sorry, there's a very recent tutorial I released and it was about making different polygon looks. And in it, I use this elephant model that, that you get inside the content browser from uh, Cinema. I like the elephant because it has very evenly sized polygons everywhere. Like the dog, there's way more polygons on the head and it's not as good for demos. Um, and I like elephants. They're cool. Uh, now, for what we're going to be doing, uh, I just want the single model. And it's really important for there, it to be watertight. So I'm going to close the uh, eye holes. But the idea here is it was driving me crazy. I almost didn't record the tutorial because I thought it would be so perfect for this tool. And that is uh, all the different polygon looks that we are generating are really powerful and that you explore them. But as you make more and more copies, it starts slowing your scene down so much or you have to turn everything off. And then that's where the workflow really starts getting clunky in regular cinema. But now we've got this. Let's rename it elephant. And I'll right click and create a recall tag. And double click. There we go. We've got the initial state. Now, the fun comes in for starting to modify this. If you've never done this, then it blew my mind when I realized that you could do this type of stuff with a bevel. When you make your regular bevel, typically you're like, okay, well, this is what a bevel does. It finds the sharp edges and it's going to bevel them. Now, if you want, you could say, don't worry about using the angle. And now everything gets beveled. That could be cool. But there are other modes. You can change your component mode from edges to points. And instantly every point is getting beveled. And what that means is you kind of get each point turns into a four-sided polygon. So by taking this and increasing the radius, you can see that we end up with like this ever increasing size polygon. If I turn on limit, then as I increase the scale, they will each collide with each other and you essentially get an inverted geometry elephant. Our, the flow lines of the polygons are no longer up and down, left and right. They're now diagonal, which by itself is a really cool look. So the idea here would go into like, okay, that's neat by itself. And maybe I want to keep that. So I could make another recall tag and store that, but let's start going fancier. And now we've inverted those. What if we put this into a connect object because it needs to be baked down. So they're re-welded together and now those are re-welded. So now that those are welded, what if I, oops, let's make a copy of this bevel. And now what's happening is it's in, it's taking the original one, making it diagonal and then redoing it. But if I were to go a little bit easier on this, then now you can see I can put a second bevel in there and you see these little tiles come out and you can see how we can start parametrically making some really wild looking meshes on here. Imagine running sketch and tune through this where you get the different lines drawn and then things can start getting even crazier. Um, well, let's say this is a state I want to keep. So I'd actually put these tags up to the top level. This is how you avoid the inception thing is I just keep moving the tags up. So now I'll make another copy of a tag and duplicate it. So now I've got the original elephant, the one bevel version and now there's the double bevel version and you just keep moving the tags up and you avoid inception i should start i should probably put that in the video somewhere is um like move the tags up avoid inception 
But anyway, um, now I could do something like creating a smoothing deformer and put that after the second bevel. And now look at this crazy pattern we get. It starts almost looking like brick. So the more, if we go back to the original, you see it looks like that. And as it slowly smooths out, you see how the polygons try and even out in a really interesting way. Now that starts, I mean, it's cool looking and you can see, look at the flow we get in these legs. It's so cool. It starts getting like these alternating polygons. So that's awesome. But something you can see that happens when you do that is it starts getting really skinny. So I might want to counter inflate it. And my favorite way to do that, to do that these days is create a plane effector. But if we put the effector, actually I'm going to put it, directly in the elephant. It's going to be the first thing that happens. I'm going to say, actually, plain effector, you are not an effector. You are a deformer. So I can say it is affecting the points. And now you can see it's going to look really crazy. But that's because the parameter is by default on Y, but pushing outward is always Z. So let's put that to zero. And as we increase or decrease on Z, you see it's going to get fatter. Or if we go down, it actually gets skinnier. So I could say, okay, let's make this elephant fatter. Or yeah, essentially we're compensating for how much it's shrinking because of the smoothing. So now you can see we've got this fatter elephant and we've got this crazy looking geometry. Let's make another tag because we've got another cool look there. And it just starts turning into like, we can keep on layering and layering and layering and getting crazier and crazier looks on it. So here, let's put another bevel after the smoothing. And now, now look at, we get little triangles on top of each of those and I could shrink those a little bit. So that pattern is cool there. They start looking very rounded. In fact, we could turn up some subdivisions and really round those out. So now look at the geometry of this, like just mesh. And I have done tests. This does work on like an animated character. Um, it's slow because it has to do all this mesh deforming when you're, while you're going. But the point being is in the tutorial, I made so many, I made like 25 different examples. But you, know, you have to imagine that if, if you were doing kind of the regular method, you'd have to make a copy of this, like no recall, you know, pretend we don't have recall. You have to make a copy of that. But these parametric bevels really slow you down. Like they will slow down cinema. So you'd have to make a copy of this, hide it. But if you're being smart, you'd also have to turn off the checkboxes. Now you could put into a layer, but even layers are not as fast as the checkbox being turned off. So you imagine every time I make a tag, I'd have another elephant and another elephant. I have to go hide it, turn it off, hide it, turn it off. If I want to bring back one back, I'd have to make another or, or bring it back or make a copy of it, unhide it, drag it back on again. If this was linked to anything, I'd have to move it in position. Now I have the original one to deal with. So even in a kind of simplistic example here where we're just storing a model, uh, I don't know if I stored this one or not, but let's just store that again. Now I can just double click. Like it's so like my brain is just freed up being like, nope, I can go back to there, to there, to there, to there, to there. And they're, they're just back. And you can see how quickly I can jump to each of those. And even, you know, going back to the organization, like I, I guess for seeing the display, I'd probably even zoom up here. So it's like, yes, it's an elephant, but I want to see the pattern. So if I go to the you know, here's the second tag, go to the notes. I want to render the view and we're in polygon mode so I can see the polygons. And now I can go to the second one and now I can see that. Let's render that view, go to the third one, render this and fourth one, render that. And, you, and now I can very quickly select my different tags and be like, oh yeah, that's what that is. That's what that is. And it happens when I wanted it to go back to the original, render that. So yeah, all those get instantly stored and they work that way. And it was killing me not to have this tool when I recorded that tutorial, because this would have been so good to, um, to be like, how about this? How about this? How about this? And then we can even go to like a look, we'd be like, oh, that look was really cool. So here's some key thing about, it. we haven't even done this really, but like, so we've gone further. I've, I've gone further where there's another bevel and it got super rounded, but we can go back to an earlier state. Let's go back to here and be like, oh, this is cool. Let's continue from here. So in this case, how about adding another bevel, but that one will be on edge mode and it might explode him. So you never know, but I'm going to say, uh, use all angles. And I can see each of them is getting beveled. And then after that happens, maybe another smooth happens and let's see how much smoothing will help. Let's put in a couple extra iterations of smoothing. Uh, I don't like that pattern as much, but let's see back to point mode. Oh, okay. There we go. So I put this to point mode. Now, if we do point, well, let's show, let me show you. So you see, I've got these tiny little triangles in the corners now, but if I bevel again, or I'm sorry, if I smooth it, then now look at this crazy pattern we get. Look at these polygons. It's insane. But you see what I did is I went to an older state modified from there, but now I can just add another recall tag to the end 
override at the end. And now I was essentially able to jump back to any state earlier on and kind of do a different branching path. So I can go back to a super early one like this. Well, let's not go that far. I like the one with the connect. So I can go back to this connect and we got that effect and be like, okay. And then after that happens, I'll do another bevel and that one can be really small. And now that that's happened, actually we'll do a two subdivision one. And then after that, I'll do some smoothing and see what that gives us. Well, that's a weird one. Mm. Yeah, I don't like that one that much. We'll leave it here because that's kind of cool. I like these circles. So you can see how I went back to the third state and now I could be like, okay, whatever, make another tag, override it. Now I've got that as well. So once again, back to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and all of them are different looks. I could select all of them. Go back and rename or number them. We could we could manually if you're just showing if you're just uh, getting here recently, you can type in any letter that you want. So we could even type out words. I've been, I've been me and my brothers have been um, sometimes sending each other messages where we write it out and recall and take a screenshot. But yeah, you know, like you know, you can do whatever you want as far as naming these. Put any characters you want in here. I could put like a hashtag or hashtag exclamation mark and you just type in there another way of staying organized sepwin thank you so much for purchasing let me know what you think of it keep me up to date uh pro tools um yeah back background story how long has it been since me and my brother wrote the very first line of code for recall <clears throat> for recall well actually uh, for even more backstory this is not the first tool we've been working on. We're actually working on something like a suite of tools unrelated, and it's taking a lot longer than I was hoping it would take. And while we're working on that, I was like, hey, I've got a little idea for a tool. And I told my brother about it. And he's like, okay, I, I, I see what you want. And it was actually a very simple idea. And at the time, it was, it was the core of Recall, but it only worked on one object. It only worked on a single object. And it's kind of like, oh, you can make a sphere editable and then bring it back to the parametric state. And as soon as he, he made it, very, he made that really quickly. And he gave it to me. And I was like, oh, wow. And I started playing with it. I was like, wait a minute. There is there is something way fancier here. There, we can go way further with this idea. And we spent a lot of time like exploring, going down avenues that were just no good, like trying to recreate too much Cinema 4D functionality. We had to trust in Cinema to do a lot of its own work. And then, you know, we back and forth again and again. The first line of code, I mean, it's probably written, the first line of code is probably written like six months ago. But then we kind of didn't touch it for a month or so while we were focused on some other things. And then I went back to it and I was like, wait a minute, this is really good. And, and he made some tweaks. And then I was like, okay, this is actually huge. This is not part of that suite of tools. This is a standalone tool. It's too big. It's too powerful. And this needs to be out there. It's like, I want to be using this tool in my live streams. And I can't use a private plugin that nobody else has access to. We need to build this out all the way. So it kind of jumped in line ahead of the other tools. And that's how this one, that's how this one came out. Um, is my shirt beveled? Uh, it's, I do like the shirt. I actually bought this shirt because it looks like a bunch of splines. Um, thanks, Crossfader, for hanging out. Um, let's see. Uh, Blue Tones Blue. Is my brother a Cinema 4D user as well? Well, first of all, I have two brothers. Well, I actually have three. But I have two brothers who are part of the company. My two, me and my two brothers started Rocket Lasso together. So we're all, we're, we are all partners in the company. They don't want to be in front of the camera at all. Like they, that's not, they don't want that. And they are programmers at heart. And, um, having now having said that, um, one of, one of them, they, they, they both know enough cinema to be able to test the plugins and whatnot. They know surprisingly little about it in general. But then one of my brothers ended up getting really interested in some a different YouTube project he was doing. And he ended up learning a lot of cinema and creating a bunch of like intro animations and, and whatnot for their for a unrelated video series. So at that point, he did end up learning a bunch. But what's funny is like he comes from a code background. So there was actually things you could do in cinema and he didn't know how they worked. So he would just write his own code to be like, oh, this camera is not blending very well between these objects. So here's a series of nulls, like connect them together and the camera will blend between them. And I was like, well, you could have done that with a tracer object. He's like, I didn't know. He's like, it's like 12 lines of code. Um, so it's pretty funny. Um, uh, a guy, guy, 
I, I super apologize. I have no idea how to pronounce your name over here on YouTube. So I'm not even going to try and butcher it, but thank you very much. Um, Gare me. That's going to be my guess. It's probably horrible. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. It looks like the questions are slowly wrapping up. So I'll give it a little bit more time. If anybody has any questions, we're going to be wrapping this up. If we are, uh, gal, gil, gear, gil, Hermie? Hermie? Is it, is it Hermie though? Like Hermes in the Futurama? Gil Hermie? Gil Hermie? I don't know. <laughs> uh, let me see if I have any models I haven't popped up. Um, and yeah, this one's not too fancy of a model. Actually, oh, I didn't. Well, I'll pull this one over and let me make sure I share the screen before I forget. Yeah, Guillermo. If it was Guillermo, I could have done it. But Guillermo. Guillermo? I don't know. <laughs> I give up. I'm sorry. But but anyway, I appreciate it. Um uh, Carson, yes, there are features on the list, or th at least things we're going to explore for future versions. But I don't, I don't really talk about future versions. Um, just like I didn't talk about Recall until it was ready to go. Um, here's just a, here's a, here's a model where this is actually a real one. Actually, let me show you something super cute if I can pull it up quick enough. So I've been working on, like I said, I've been working on some robots. Well, when I had more free time, it's been so insanely busy recently. But let me pull up my daily robot series. And here's the robot five render. Nope, that's not the right one. Um, I guess it is five. Renders. So this is a, this is a very fast render test. So this is just like a quick HDR I took of the room. And you can see the wall behind me. So this is a character I was working on. And this is just an animation walk cycle test. So not meant to be final. And I think he's super cute. Now, when I build these things, they're built out of like so many bulls. Like there's bulls and there's bulls upon bulls upon bulls upon bulls. And obviously, when you're going to go to animate it, you need to bake it all down. So obviously, a good thing to have is signal. Now, take a look at his shoulder here. So there's his shoulder. And that is what we're looking at here. Actually, this might be more of his knee. But you see, it's one of his parts. So here's the idea where when... This is what it actually looks like while I'm working on it. So I keep everything, once again, like it's just me. I keep everything as parametric as possible. Some things I will make editable, but you, like here's the overall shape. And so the, it, because I made this editable at any point, I could grab this and say, okay, that should be tapered. It should be bent forward and take a bite out of the front. You can see how it opens up options like that. But I can't I can't run this through an animation because that's going to be insane for that to be refreshing every frame. So then I can go and bake it down. So that's the baked down version of this. And now is the step when I want to bevel everything. And you cannot bevel this parametric version, like this final one. It just won't bevel. There's too many weird, like extra points and whatnot. I do wish Cinema's modeling was a little bit sharper along those lines. But, and you can see here, actually, let me see if I can show you. If I select all, you can see that there's a lot of, when you do bevels, you get a lot of things like this where these extra points are selected. And those are like redundant points. So that that happened, and then I clean it up. And then if I double click this one, you can see the cleaned up version where I removed all of those points. And then I was able to put a bevel on it. And now I'm actually able to get really nice bevels on this model that I did the cleanup. But you never know, maybe I need to go back and make a tweak to the steps. So then I make another recall tag and I bake, that's where I baked it down. So you can see it goes all the way from parametric to baked down, to cleaned up, baked down, to baked down bevel. And this one is now ready for animation and it's as clean as it could possibly be. So it's another place where I'm definitely gonna be using a lot of recall to make everything really nice and clean, but never be worried about being able to go back to an earlier step. Um, Paul, you cannot keyframe recall. Recall is a workflow tool, so there are not any keyframes. You see, there's no dots anywhere because it's all about the user storing something and then bringing, back, bringing it back when they want to. Um, I just remembered a demo file we have not covered yet, which is possibly important. Um, new neural thing. Oh, you mean um, somebody's asking a question about uh, um, the stuff they showed off at the SIGGRAPH presentation, uh, they called it Neutron. So it's some of the future versions of cinema. So mm, um, I can't, I can't talk about it. I'm on, I'm on 
I, I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about that topic, so we'll leave it there. Um, but it, if it lives in the object manager, then recall should be able to handle it, is, is what I'll say. Um, now, this one, this is not a... Go ahead. Anybody who has any questions? Oh, um, yeah, I'm super NDA'd, and it's dangerous to talk about on any part of the topic because I never know quite what I've got covered or not. Um, <laughs> Pro Tools. <laughs> um, yes, we we are. Yeah, we'll leave it that way. I'm on it. Like we'll be we'll be addressing anything that comes our way in the future and making sure that everything works. Um, anyway, this is a little more techy of a demo. But let me show you some of the advanced features while anybody gets any final questions. Um, Paul, <laughs> okay, Paul, just for super clarity, you're still, you're, Paul's asking about the ability to trigger recall at different times. We intentionally built it to not be able to be triggered. It is not supposed to be triggered. It's supposed to store the current state and bring that current state back. So um, I was kind of mentioning it earlier, but imagine there's no way that we know what the user is putting it on, not, in any, not, not unless we're we have a rule when we're programming, which is never try and like outthink the user, like let the user do what the user wants to do. And we don't know if you are trying to recall a recall. Uh, you're not, we don't know if you're trying to recall a cloner with a dynamics tag with a really complicated series of cubes that all have soft bodies. And now, now imagine if that's what was stored and then you suddenly say, oh, I want to bring that in at frame 25. Like it would, that would be chaos, and it would it could crash your file, it could crash your computer, and, and, and that's just cinema. Cinema is not from code from a code from a code point of view. Objects are not just supposed to suddenly appear inside the object manager. They're supposed to be created, you know, kind of by the user. So the idea of keyframes or Expresso or something like that triggering a recall tag would just be inherently dangerous inside of cinema. So instead, it's all about storing it. And if you need to, you can always make two copies of the object and then, you know, do whatever you do manually, like use a pose morph and transition between them. But that's the idea. Oh, no, Paul, I'm with you. I get it. And I, I can definitely see a lot of uses for it, but it's a dangerous thing to do. So at least for now, we we didn't approach it. it. That's definitely something on the list to look into more, but it just goes into cinema's not built to function that way. Well, I, I'll tell you, here's I'll, here's one spoiler for an idea for possibly a thing. I've had people, because I've, I've sent this off to different people in the industry, including beta testers and some friends of mine. And so there's people who've been using it in like professional environments. I, I sent it to Beeple and Beeple really likes it. So I've been, I might, I'll probably be splattering the Beeple quote all over the place. Um, and I've gotten requests about the idea of taking a series of recall tags and exploding them out into like a takes system, like like explode recalls out into takes. And I like I said, takes don't doesn't like objects appearing and disappearing. So I think what it would end up doing would be some sort of functionality where you could explode them out and then they'd be hidden. Like you you'd pick like a trigger point and then they would just activate and deactivate the stoplights so they all exist in the scene and then they just kind of unhide themselves at different times and that could ex be exploded out from a recall tag that's a thought i have but essentially from a coding point of view the way cinema is designed it's a really bad idea for things to pop into existence and out of existence while it's it's playing so that that's why um <laughs> I don't know, Paul, I don't know if Beeple actually does versioning as they travel forward, but he does say that he can now he can forge ahead confidently and not have to worry about breaking something down. So, but yeah, but yeah, that's the idea. Um, anyway, anyway, I want to show a couple of fancy features here. Now, this is a very kind of dry demo. Um, I, I could make a fancier, but I think this explains it the best. And that is these other settings, the adopt parent PSR, adopt child PSRs, and replace children. So let's talk about those. What do I got? I got two hierarchies here. I got a cube and then a child, child, child going upward, and a sphere and a child, child, child going upward. So if we were to right click on the sphere and add a recall tag, I can double click and it stores it. There you go. It's just stored. So the natural workflow here is if I move it up to the cube, if I recall it, it's going to turn that cube and everything about it 
into the sphere stack. So let's do that. Double click. And now you see that the sphere stack or the cube stack is gone. And now it's been replaced by the sphere stack. The sphere stack took on the PSR of the original object. And now it's just gone. It's turned into these spheres. That's that's the default workflow. That's the way everything works in recall out of the box. But we have other options. We could say, hey, don't replace the children. So we did this uh, just a little bit earlier, but here's a kind of different example. If I say don't replace the children, what I've done is I, I'm saying this, this tag is storing all the spheres. And I'll, now I'm on this cube specifically. And if I recall now, that cube, that cube has now disappeared and become the sphere. But it's kind of like that cube has single handedly become the entire stack of spheres and its children get to live on. So that's kind of neat right there out of the box. I'm going to turn replace children back on again. And this time, let's turn on adopt child PSRs. So I'm going to turn that on. So once again, I'll even do it from scratch. On the spheres, right click, add a new recall tag, double click, store it. So everything's default. Move this up to the cube. Now, default behavior, if I were to double click, hierarchy is destroyed, replaced by the spheres. However, if we turn on, well, I guess just for clarity, there's also adopt parent PSR. So if I turn that off, then now it's not attempting to go to where this object is, which is kind of weird. Um, there are reasons to do this, but if I were to double click, it looks like they disappeared, but they didn't. The cubes have been destroyed, replaced by these spheres, and they took on the original PSR of the object. So it actually just moved them back here. At that point, it's the same as copy and pasting, but there might be reasons to, like, that if there's a bunch of instances of this, then we could replace it with that, and it would work. But anyway, let's go back to complete defaults. This is out of the box. But now, oop, uh, let me hit undo a couple times. Get the cubes back. Okay, now we're back to total defaults. And now let's look at adopt child PSRs. That is off by default. If I turn it on, then now we've got four spheres stored in the recall tag. So now if I recall, the four spheres are going to where the four cubes used to be. It's matching based on the hierarchy. So the first sphere goes to where the first cube used to be, the second to the second, third, third, fourth, the fourth. If the hierarchies don't match, like if there's more spheres, they would just take on their original PSR, like their, their original relative PSR. But the, um, but the uh, ability to adopt from one to another is pretty cool. And then uh, let's undo and let's see. Here's the kind of the last thing combination of these. And uh, these are going to be useful like in circumstances. But like I said, this is the not 99%. This is the 1% use case type thing. But uh, let's even do this again from scratch. So on the sphere, I'm going to say, I want to store a recall. Let's store that one. And then... I'm going to copy it onto every one of these cubes. And now we have four copies of that recall tag. If I were to select, if I select all of them and I say, hey, I want to recall all four of them. Let me do that. I'll hit recall. And what do we get? Well, not much because what happened is the first cube had the first recall. So that one executed, which means it destroyed the entire hierarchy. It's gone. It replaced it with this one. And now there's no second tag to trigger. It it just went away. So it's done. It just replaces it. So that's no that's not very interesting. But if we have all four tags and we turn off replace children, then now it's not deleting these children. But every one of the children has its own recall tag. So these four tags will see these four cubes. And if I hit recall, we'll actually get four stacks of spheres. So it's kind of a cool way of transitioning all these individual objects into whatever we're copying onto them. Like I said, this is a very uh, mechanical explanation of it. Yeah, it would be a lot cooler if this was a, a table and then there's, just, there's some item on the table and we're going to replace that single item on the table with an entire like place setting or something like that. Like that's, you know, you can imagine doing that type of thing and an entire hierarchy. So that's the idea of those mechanical ones. Um, thank you over on YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, I am again, Philakesh, that's my best bet. I apologize for butchering your name, but thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and once again, um, well, let me open up another file because I forgot to open this one earlier Boop. and because it's a fun, another fun example. Um, but just again, to throw it out there, um, as a recap for anyone who is just getting here recently, thank you. So much for coming and checking out the new tool. I'm really excited about it. This is the very first tool. This is the essentially the first time recall 
well, I'm sorry, this is the first time Rocket Lasso is going to be making its own money from something we've produced. So we've been working for a year and a half on tools, all the while doing free live streams, free tutorials, and this is the first money we're going to be making. So that's so that's one thing. I appreciate the idea. Well, I, I really like the idea. It's one of the reasons I wanted to start my own company is I like the idea of being able to help people. And by helping people, I can make tools. And now they can help me, not by just giving me money for making tutorials. They can give me... They can help me and pay me for like the tutorials because I made a tool that's really useful to them. Like I made a tool and now they can buy that tool. It's going to give them value and it gives me value. So I, I, it feels like I'm creating more in the world. So that's always really fun. So thank you so much, everybody, for supporting. Uh, another quick another quick heads up. If you are supporting on Patreon, there are coupons for recall. So if you're supporting a $10 level, there's actually an $11 coupon. And if you're at the $20 level, there's a $21 coupon. So feel free to jump on over to uh, Patreon if you want to support there. And then you also get access to the archived uh, scene files, the archived bonus streams. And, you know, and that, uh, you know, that support is appreciated as well. So thank you so much, everybody. Also, if you buy recall while, while the stream's going, like somebody uh, shout it out in the chat so I can thank you. Um, um, let's see. Uh, Flavio. Flavio. I just want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, Flavio, I've, I see your stuff online. And um, uh, this is not made in Python. This is made in C++. This is 9,000 lines of C++ for Cinema 4D. So not a, not a casual thing for sure. Um, anyway, I've got another demo scene I'd like to show off. Um, let's see. And the longer you watch an ad online, the more likely you are to convert it to a purchase. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, as I show all these use cases, then it's like, well, it's pretty good. <laughs> C++, you guys are so nerd. Yeah, no, we are. I'm actually, I know, I know some C sharp. Uh, my brothers are really good at C++ though. Um, I know I'm, I'm most dangerous in Python myself. Sometimes I prototype things in Python and I give it to my brothers. Sometimes I prototype them in Expresso and then as a way of like testing out some of the basic features. Um, but we've been, as I had said earlier, we, um, between me and my brother Danny and my brother Joe, you know, being at GSG, we have 20 years of experience developing Cinema 4D plugins, which is insane. So that's a, a fun little detail as well. So... Uh, I want to show this demo because we didn't really get the chance to talk about this one. So do you remember the lamp demo we did? Should I do that again from scratch? I almost think I should. Um, yeah, I, I will do it from scratch. So how about I'm going to close that. In fact, leave it up a new, new file. Let's do a worst case scenario. So you see I've got this classroom here and there's all these chairs. And this happened all the time to me. Like uh, I'd be getting scene files in from like Vectorworks or from CAD software. And it's like, okay, they're all here. And you can see like this really messy hierarchy, like all of these chairs, this big mess. And I could collapse it down and you can see, okay, we've got like 44 different chairs. The client doesn't want that chair anymore. It's like, okay, how am I gonna swap these out? Like, there's different ways of going about it, but let me show you a nice new way of doing it. So opening up a new file, let's jump into the content browser, traveling to, let's see, under, the, you get all these scene files from the Cinema uh, the Cinema 4D download page. They, they, they give you these for free. Um, inside the seating folder, there is a chair section and here's a bunch of chairs. So I'm going to select that chair and that chair and that one and that one. And how about this one? And this one's already there, but we'll grab that as well. I'll drag all these in. So all of those have been dragged from the content browser into the scene. And now I've got a whole pile of chairs, all the materials, everything. So clean this up a little bit if I wanted to, I mean, we could rename them just to keep it clean. I'm going to say chair, select all down, paste, 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 paste. And then up and say one, uh, it'll be quicker to go. Chair one, two, three, three, four, five, six. Okay, so uh, I've got all these chairs. I just named them so it's a little bit cleaner. And it's a bit of a mess right now with all in there. But if I select all the chairs, right click and say recall, I can now click the store button and all of those have automatically stored the chairs. Deselecting the first one, I can drag all of these tags up to the first object, and now I've got six different recall tags on one chair. 
I am now free to delete the other chairs. And now I've got this one. So now I can double click on the different tags and it will instantly turn them into that specific chair. If we want to stay organized, it's pretty nice to double click on a particular recall tag and say, hey, let's color pick this nice dark color from there. Double click here, grab this cream color. And we'll just do these because why not? Nice bright orange. Here's a yellow. I'm going to try and get kind of the brighter points. Here's a white one. I'll grab a really bright point. And then ooh, a blue one. So I'll grab a pretty solid blue there. There. Now it's a quicker way to be able to tell which chair it is. So there we go. Now we got a rig of a bunch of different types of chairs. Um, I guess if we're going all the way, we could also stay extra, extra organized by going into a particular one, going into the notes. I could write some stuff, but you can see the entire contains all listed. But now I'll frame up nicely on that and say render view. And now I get a little preview of that chair. Double click on this one. See that chair, render the view, double click here, render the view and just do that for every chair. So now you in the future or some, you know, coworker or something can click on them and I'll even just reframe up on this. It's even like, you know, I might because it's a tiny preview, I want it to go quick. So we can even frame, frame up a little bit more like that just to see it in more detail. But now really quickly, even from the icon, but now also in the image, we can tell what they are. But the main one of the main points is the recall workflow is supposed to be so quick that really you can just double click and be like, oh, that one, that one, no, that one, that one. No, you know what? I did want that one. And that, you know, that's the way I think. But in any case, um, let's jump on over to the chair, copy it. And now once again, this is the one caveat with Recall, when you copy something, make sure you don't close the current scene file if you're going to paste it into a different one. Because now what's going to happen is when I hit paste, when, um, oops, sorry, this, that has to load. And now when I hit paste, and that, that was not recall taking a while. Let me show you again. Now it's there, I hit paste. And now that comes in. And what's actually happening is these recall tags are saying like, oh, I suddenly exist. I'm a recall tag. What am I supposed to be? And it has to go look at the other scene file and bring the information over. So all that information has been brought over. I now have all these chairs because they're in the content browser. They're sharing all the same material. So there's no problem with materials copying and pasting. And now I can double click on, maybe those materials didn't, uh, I'm not sure why they're not showing. Oh, it's, oh, something about the way I copied it actually. I'll have to think about that. Um, I think I did the process differently because that usually works. So, well, let's assume that that worked. So let me say revert to saved file and we'll just bring it back in. So now we're in the exact same state, except I have my chairs actually working. Maybe I built it in the scene file. I'm not sure. So here's all the chairs. So now we've got them stored with the different chair variants and we're back to having this big mess of chairs everywhere. So if I were to say, actually, all these chairs, these should be that blue chair. What I could do is just copy this blue tag holding down control or command. I can drag this over onto the top chair. I'm going to say right click, copy tag children. So it's going to copy this recall tag. Not only, I mean, it's not only copied onto that seat. It's actually copied onto all of the children as well. So there's a lot of them. But if I were to just select this top layer one on all these chairs, scroll down, select the bottom. So I now got all of those selected. Click the recall button here. So they're all triggered and that boom, instantly that quickly, all of these chairs have turned into this chair instead. And now that I was able to update like a messy CAD file type of situation where these all like jumped into the appropriate position, I can select this top tag, right click, select children of same type and then hit delete. And now I've deleted all those recall tags. And another thing to note is even when I had all those tags, let's actually change these over to a different chair. I'll copy this white one over, right click and copy tag to children. Even though there's all these guys, let's expand it. You can see there's so many copies of recall right now, but that doesn't make your scene file any bigger. All these tags are copies of the original. So they're all referencing that same information because otherwise this, this file would suddenly be like 300 megs but it's not, it's just as small as a single chair being stored. But now I can select all those children tags, say, uh, click recall. And even with all that geometry, everything swapping out, those chairs have now transferred, transformed into this white chair. They're ready to go. I can now once again, select identical child tags, delete, and those chairs have been swapped over. There's a lot of different circumstances where that might be something that's really important and it would be a pain in the butt to change otherwise. And now we can do it in a couple clicks.
Mr. Met Dog, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, I think I have finally gotten to every single scene file that I had. So I think if there's no more questions, I guess it's your last chance, your last chance to ask a question and then I'm going to go. So any questions about the tool, about the process, about uh, anything at all? Oh, um, uh, Leo, when you copy them to a new scene file, that once they are now copied to the new scene file, they're now part of that new scene file. I mean, technically, they're the ones in the original one are part of the original, and the ones in the new one are just in the new one. They they don't need a constant link to the other one. They just need that one moment to import all the information, and then it's in the scene file. And um, that is that's the deal. Um. And you, no, you don't need to save the previous scene file either. It just needs to be open for a moment. Like I said, the uh, when I make when I made this chair here, when I copy and paste this into the other file, the file has to be like, oh, you paste it, and it's like, oh, the recall tag's like, I'm here. What am I supposed to be? And it checks the other scene file. It's like, oh, that's what I am. It brings that information over, and now it's all done. Like, there's no more link or anything. It just needed that split second to transfer it over. So, uh Oliver, yeah, good to hear Oliver. Oliver actually was the very first purchase. He was totally on it. As soon as I posted on Patreon, he instantly got it. So I do appreciate that. Um, question, can you add tool tip descriptions to each recall tag? Um, what does that mean? Is it that like, does do other things do that? Like when you mouse, can you elaborate essence? by what you mean like in cinema if i mouse over things like there's not a message do you mean like this little message down here because right now it's going to show it says recall expression actually um so is that what you mean like a little message down there um in which case we didn't do that but that could be maybe that could be something that we do in the future uh that's actually a good idea um can you, are you in uh, essence, are you on the Slack channel? Can you send me a message about that? Because that'd be a good idea to add in, in the future. And I'm going to forget if I don't write it down right now, I'm going to forget. And I want to keep going. Um, uh, X list. I'm not sure I follow your question, uh, but I'm pretty much just taking recall questions today. And uh, we, there was a question about the future. The Maxon had been speaking about the new neutron system when they did their presentation at at uh SIGGRAPH, digital SIGGRAPH. and uh the only thing i can say is whatever maxon comes out with we're going to make sure that recall is compatible with it so that is uh that's a thing that we will always do um can i get that yeah the read only version that will definitely be a thing and like I said, right now you can send it. You, you if you render and send it to a scene, you could send it to a render farm right now. You could go send it to Pixel Plow, and their render farm will say, "Hey, you're missing a plugin," but it's going to render completely fine because once again, recall doesn't trigger while it's playing. Recall only triggers if somebody double clicks. So, like in the very first example I did today with the four cameras, whichever camera I'm on, that's the one that's going to render, and you don't need recall for that because it's currently live in the scene. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think um, yeah, Carson. They mean to make a, mold, a tool tip. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, you. Oh, actually, yeah, essence. Well, yeah, go ahead and elaborate. But were you saying that you want this description to be what the user types in? Because potentially that's a thing we could do. Like whatever you type in the notes, that when you mouse over, that could potentially be what shows up here. Maybe. I don't know. That could be something that's like hard coded. But if it is what you mean, that'd be actually kind of cool. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I did not follow, but luckily Carson Jones over on YouTube. So there's two people talking on Twitch and YouTube right now through me which is kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's actually a really good idea. I didn't think about that. So that could be definitely a 1.1 type of option. Uh, Sean, thank you. That's appreciated. Um, so I guess if I don't see any more questions coming in and we have been going for three hours straight. So that is definitely plenty of demo and plenty of questions. So we'll just start wrapping this stuff up. If another question pops in, I'll still answer it. But um, I just want to, again, say thank you so much for coming and hanging out. It's always really fun. It's really tough for everybody these days as far as, you know, being socially distanced and whatnot. And the kind of things do feel a little bit like a hangout and having conversations with people. So that's always great by itself. But even more importantly, thank you so much for supporting Rocket Lasso. As I was 
saying earlier, all of the free tutorials, all of the live streams, they are supported by us selling these tools. So when you buy one of these tools, not only you're getting something really powerful and useful for you and your workflow and speeding you up and making so you can make more money, you're making it so that we can make those free tutorials. We don't take on any client work. All we do is make tutorials and we make tools for Cinema 4D. So thank you so much for supporting. Um, one quick last heads up, uh, if you haven't already gotten recall, you should totally go get it because it's awesome. And I just spent three hours explaining all the ways that it is. And we still didn't talk about everything. We just talked about most things. Um, if you support on Patreon, then you can get some coupons over there. So head on over to Patreon to get it. If you hit exclamation mark recall, you can get some info popping up in the chat and um, at least uh, there. And actually, why don't I, why don't I put a final link in there? So anyway, who is still hanging out? If I haven't, uh, I, if I haven't convinced you to go get recall, I don't know what I could possibly say, but here is the link to go see all of the info for recall. If you want to pick it up and support it, it's deeply appreciated. But in any case, thank you so much, everybody. I will see you probably next week for another live stream. Um, so just keep an eye out for the regular Wednesday stream. If you're not a regular, then make sure you sign up on Twitch. It sends you a free email and every time I go live. And if you're on YouTube, like just, you know, keep an eye out for that. Make sure you subscribe as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and hanging out. I really, really do appreciate it. And this was a lot of fun. It's been driving me crazy not being able to show this off, even for like four months where it's been pretty functional. But man, getting getting those other like... 8,000 lines of code to make sure all the undos work and the double click features work, everything. There's a lot, it takes a lot of effort. So uh, I really do appreciate it, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. I'll see you next week. I'll see you in the next tutorial. And that will do it for me. I got to go like take a nap or something. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>